go back into a unit on Roman history. Uh, each year we try to cover a little bit of Roman history. Back uh, at the beginning we covered, um, you know, the origins of Rome, the birth of the Republic and the Punic Wars. And we're really going to pick up at the end of the Punic Wars where we left off maybe in seventh grade or eighth grade. Uh, we're going to pick up at the end of the Punic Wars and um, we're going to talk about a period in Roman history known as the Late Republic and an episode in Roman history known as the Roman Revolution. So when you think of revolution, you think of change. There'd be a lot of different kinds of change, but you think of change. Uh, the Roman Revolution refers to a political change, um, very much like, you know, when you think of the American Revolution um, or the French Revolution, for example. However, the Roman Revolution is going to go in the opposite direction as when you think of the American Revolution. So when you think of the American Revolution, you think of, um, you know, Americans, colonists, um, getting rid of King George III and beginning a new form of representative government. Uh, on the contrary here, the Roman Revolution uh, is going to take the Republic, which is why this period is sometimes called the Late Republic, and the Republic is going to fall apart to be replaced by the Empire. You know, this is actually probably much of the inspiration behind the Star Wars movies. If you've ever watched the prequel trilogy of the Star Wars movies, kind of tells the story about how the Republic falls apart and is replaced by the Emperor or the Empire. Uh, so that is really what's going on in the Roman Revolution here. Uh, one of the most successful republics in history, a republic that lasted for uh, about 500 years, you know, twice as long as the American government has been around. Uh, this republic begins to fall apart and is replaced by uh, one ruler, one person, one emperor uh, in charge. So how does that come about? Uh, our founding fathers were very interested in this. What, what were the weaknesses of the Roman Republic that led to that Republic completely falling apart and being replaced by uh, a one-man rule again? Uh, so it's an important period in history um, it's important to study this period, to look at, you know, uh, what we can learn uh, from this period of history. And it's also the period of Roman history that we know a great deal about, uh, mostly on account of uh, somebody named Cicero. Uh, but we know a great deal about this period of Roman history. Uh, and some of the most famous names that come down to us from Roman history, uh, names like Julius Caesar, Mark Antony, uh, Augustus, Cleopatra, all of those names come from this period of Roman history. So it's an interesting period of Roman history. It's been inspirational to artists and to filmmakers and to writers for, you know, thousands of years. Um, and so uh, it, it's one of the most important periods for us to study uh, in Roman history. And it's it's from this period also that we get some of the greatest Roman literature, you know, immediately following uh, the the period of the Roman Revolution. Uh, we get the golden age of Latin literature with people like Virgil and Horace and Ovid. Um, so an important period for Latin students and for anybody in general wanting to know more about uh, things that influence our own government today and things that have captured the minds and the imaginations of people uh, since this occurred. So, um, we begin with post-bellum. Post-bellum means after the war. And as I alluded to earlier, I'm talking about the Punic Wars. So, Rome fought a series of wars against um, its neighbors to the south, Carthage. Uh, three wars... Uh, which collectively are known as the Punic Wars. Remember, the Romans got the word Punic from the word poina. Uh, the, um, the Carthaginians were, they, they saw them as Phoenician colonists, and that was the word for Phoenician. So instead of calling it the Carthaginian Wars, they simply called it the Punic Wars. Um, by the time of the end of the Third Punic War, Rome really rose as the dominant power throughout the entire Mediterranean. Uh, at the end of the Third Punic War, Rome would destroy the city of Carthage. Um, and in the same year, they would also destroy the Greek city of Corinth. They, they had several wars uh, that were a little bit tied in with the Punic Wars with the Greeks, uh, uh, a series of Macedonian wars. 
and uh, the combination of that ended with the destruction of the city of Corinth. So in that same year, the destruction of the city of Carthage in the end of the Third Punic War and the destruction of the city of Corinth in Greece represented Rome's complete domination of the Mediterranean Sea. And through these wars, Rome acquired vast new territories. So obviously they acquired new territories in Greece. Uh, they acquired new territories in North Africa. And, uh, you know, in the Punic Wars, they also really expanded uh, uh, first into Sicily during the First Punic War and then into Spain during the Second Punic War. So the Romans not only were, were the dominant power in the Mediterranean, but they literally owned uh, much of the territory around the Mediterranean. Uh, the Romans would eventually call the Mediterranean Mare Nostrum, which means our sea, like the Romans owned it. Okay, Mare Nostrum. Uh, so they had all of this new territory. But remember, the government that was functioning back in the city of Rome was a government that was created in 509 BC. So the, there was an earlier revolution where the Romans got rid of the last king of Rome, the seventh king, Tarquin the Proud, or Tarquin the Arrogant, Tarquinius Superbus. And uh, they replaced the monarchy with uh, their republic. Uh, that was back in 509 BC. But uh, during that time, Rome was not much more than a small city-state in the, in the middle of Italy. So it was a form of government that... Uh, really was meant for just a single city. And now it was being asked to govern a vast empire, a vast territory. Uh, so this acquisition of new territory, while it seems like a good thing for the Romans, certainly brought in a lot more money and things like that, um, you know, also exerted pressures on the Roman government. Uh, the this, this form of government, which was meant to... Um, again, just governed just a single city, was now governing this vast empire. Uh, also, because of all of Rome's uh, victories, military victories in Greece, in North Africa, uh, you know, and in their acquisition of new territories in Spain and, and, and uh, around Italy, uh, there was a vast influx of new slaves uh, that came into Rome. Uh, so what is the effect of these slaves? Well, these slaves basically took people's jobs away. So wealthy Romans uh, then turned to massive slave labor uh, instead of paying people to work on farms and, and, and paying people in the city of Rome. Uh, and so a lot of people were displaced out of their jobs. Uh, there suddenly became a, a vast amount of jobless people uh, living in the city of Rome because of this influx of slavery. Uh, those wealthy landowners uh, weren't just buying up slaves to take people's jobs away, but they were also um, buying up farms as well. They were buying up land uh, from poorer landowners and building these massive, basically, plantations and estates throughout Italy. Uh, so these, these wealthy Romans uh, built these plantations, and the term for the plantation is latifundia. Latifundia literally means like a wide farm. So latifundia, but you could think of it almost as a plantation back in ancient Rome. Uh, so these, these wealthy aristocrats were buying up uh, all these other people's small independent farms and making these giant farms and then threw the people off the farms and were working the farms with slave labor. Uh, at the same time, as I was mentioning, the government back in Rome was having a hard time basically uh, uh, governing this vast new empire they had. Uh, you know, they wanted to be able to extract resources and taxes from their new provinces. But the way that they went about doing that actually caused more problems for the Roman government in general. Uh, they basically did something uh, which is equivalent to kind of tax farming. Uh, different companies back in Rome would bid for the right to collect taxes in far-off provinces. And whatever they bid that was the actual money that the Roman government took in as its tax revenue. Then that particular company would go off to the provinces and try to make more money than what they bid, uh, try to make a profit off that. So you could see how that leads to further problems uh, because these, these companies would then go off. They really wouldn't care about the people living in the province or what they could afford to pay in forms of taxes and things. Uh, uh, they just wanted to get as much as possible out of that particular province 
uh, so as to make a profit on what they bid. Um, we're going to see as well that um, basically uh, the, the military began to, to change drastically uh, from being a military of, of mostly land-owning citizens uh, to a more professional military, but with, um, uh, with more working class or lower class soldiers serving in those, that military who couldn't afford their own gear and things. And so the Roman generals who were in charge of the military provided um, the gear, provided the pay, and provided the retirement benefits for these soldiers. So you're going to see these soldiers becoming more loyal to their commanders than they are to the central government of Rome. So some people think of it as a period of almost these, these generals acting as warlords, uh, where they each have their own seemingly private army uh, to do their bidding. And uh, the problem with that is if the soldiers are, are more loyal to the commander than they are to the central government of Rome, uh, then that's going to lead to more civil wars between these generals. And you're going to see a lengthy period of just civil war after civil war. Uh, and finally, uh, for a long time, Rome was a very uh, class-based society. Uh, there was a group of Romans called the Patricians. Patricians are the ones who could trace their ancestry back to the first senators of Rome. And then there was everybody else, who were basically called plebeians. Uh, for a long time, there were conflicts between these two groups, the patricians and the plebeians, and eventually the plebeians won various concessions from the patricians. So that the difference between patrician and plebeian uh, really wasn't that um, remarkable by the late Republican period. However, um, the plebeians, uh, some of them, had become just as wealthy as the patricians. So even though there wasn't this difference between patricians and plebeians, there still was a massive difference between uh, the wealthy aristocratic classes uh, and everybody else. Uh, there was, uh, again, people talk about a wage gap in the United States today. Well, it was vastly uh, greater in Rome. You know, uh, uh, there were people in Rome who could uh, afford, you know, millions of sesterces worth of stuff. Uh, and then there were people just scraping to get by back in Rome. So there was a massive wage gap back in Rome, and there was conflict between the poorer people and the wealthier people, uh, though this did not fall along plebeian and patrician lines as, uh, as it had generations earlier. Now, this aristocratic class in Rome basically um, consisted of the same families. Some of them were old patrician families, other of them were plebeian families that had become wealthier. But these same families kind of dominated politics in Rome. And um, usually in, in the past, during, during the earlier periods of the Republic, uh, this group of people worked together to maintain their power and maintain you know, uh, um, their advantages over, over everybody else. However, during this period of Roman history, during the late Republic, some of these people who, who should have been working to maintain the status quo, maintain the, uh, the aristocratic order, uh, had broken away from the, their fellow aristocrats, and they had um, basically joined with the common people. And so, uh, uh, you know, these people who were supposed to, in the past, would have been working with the aristocrats, now breaking away from them, um, was another big problem that that put pressures on the government. Uh, so one of the things that caused um, these wealthy aristocrats, as you will see, to break away from, uh, you know, from the, uh, the other aristocratic families was this fierce competition that began between them uh, for aristeia, which is military glory. Uh, many of these uh, aristocratic Romans grew up as a child uh, hearing stories of Alexander the Great or hearing stories of um, uh, Scipio Africanus who defeated Hannibal in the Second Punic War. And uh, they too wanted to grow up and, and to follow in those footsteps to win great military victories. But in Rome, in order to win a great military victory, you had to be in possession of an army. And so you had to win 
high political office because only those higher political offices, uh, councils and praetors, were really in charge of large groups of, uh, of, of soldiers. Um, so uh, there was a fierce competition for these political offices because there were only so many political offices to be had. And uh, so that's the word honore. So honore is the word where we get the word honor, uh, was actually the word for political office. And so these aristocrats were competing fiercely against each other for political honors, uh, political offices, uh, in the hope to having some great military command and winning some great military victory. And all of these things, winning high political offices and winning great military vic victories, would increase th their dignitas, their sense of worthiness. And that was a very important thing to these Romans, their their sense of worthiness. You know, uh, uh, you think of maybe some old mafia movie, like The Godfather or something, or they, they talk about showing people respect. So that sense of respect is is kind of wrapped up in that Latin word dignitas. So it's a sense of worthiness. And the interesting thing about dignitas is you could win it through uh, um, basically, like I said, uh, gaining great aristea, military glory, a Greek word, uh, or you could win it through gaining high political honors or, or both. Uh, you could also win it in the, in, in the courts by, by being an excellent lawyer. Um, but you, as you elevated your dignitas, you didn't just do it for yourself, but you did it for your whole family. So if you were able to gain more dignitas, not only would you have that dignitas, but everybody in your family would also have that dignitas. So you could see how these things like dignitas, how political offices, and how military glory caused there to be this fierce competition between, between aristocrats, uh, uh, so that rather than working together uh, to preserve the republic, they were fighting against each other. All right, uh, So all of these situations... Um, you know, put additional pressures on the Roman government during this period we call the late Republic. So our story of the Roman Revolution uh, really begins with the two Gracchi brothers. The eldest Gracchi brother supposedly fought himself in the Third Punic War. So we're really uh, uh, starting here with the end of the Third Punic War and uh, the destruction of the city of Carthage and this one uh, politician, named Tiberius Gracchus. So Tiberius Gracchus was part of one of these ancient patrician families. Uh, the, the, the term for these people, uh, rather than calling them patricians versus plebeians, uh, they referred to themselves as nobles. Where we get the word noble in English? So nobles literally means in Latin, like somebody who's well-known. And the reason they're well-known is because Previously, people in their family had won high political office and had won great military glory. So their family name was well known. Um, and again, it was those same families that continued to dominate uh, the government back in Rome. They let in a couple of plebeian families here and there, but it basically created a new aristocracy. And those same families uh, dominated uh, the political offices and all the military glory. They basically hogged it all for themselves. And so if you were a young man born into one of these nobles families, um, you would almost take it for granted that one day you would rise up and uh, uh, win those high political offices and have those opportunities for military glory and sit in the Senate one day. So, uh, uh, so Tiberius Gracchus probably grew up in a household, uh, especially Tiberius Gracchus. I mean, his, his mother uh, was a woman named Cornelia, and Cornelia was the daughter of the famous Scipio Africanus. So I mentioned before, one of the things that motivated these young men were these old stories of Alexander the Great and, and uh, Scipio Africanus, who defeated Hannibal. So Scipio Africanus was one of the greatest Roman generals in, in Roman history that the, that the Romans uh, uh, told stories about. And this Scipio Africanus just so happened to be Tiberius Gracchus's grandfather. So he had a lot to live up to. Unfortunately for Tiberius Gracchus, um, as he was working his way up the political ladder, uh, early in his military career, he was serving as a junior officer uh, in some uh, skirmishes uh, out in Spain. And during those battles, his uh, army was surrounded and Tiberius had to um, basically uh, come to a peace agreement uh, with the Spanish tribes in order to extract his army uh, from certain death. Uh, and so he did. But when he came back to Rome 
with this peace agreement. The peace agreement was rejected by the Roman Senate, and uh, Tiberius Gracchus was publicly humiliated. And so here's a young man who grew up his entire life thinking that, you know, that basically taking it for granted that one day uh, he would be some great praetor or council and sit in the Senate. And now he sees a dead end to his political career. He's been publicly humiliated. Uh, he had to um, uh, do this treaty in Spain uh, that, that basically was a black mark on his career. And the Senate basically treated him very badly. Uh, and so he did a very radical thing. Knowing that he had come to a dead end in his political career, working his way up the old traditional ways, um, he decided to basically renounce his patrician status and be adopted as a plebeian and uh, uh, serve as tribune of the plebs. So tribune of the plebs was a powerful political office, but had it been used to its full extent up until this time. Uh, during those conflicts between patricians and plebeians, one of the concessions the plebeians won from the patricians was to have this office called Tribune of the Plebs. And the Tribune of the Plebs had many different powers, including veto power. Uh, they were also supposed to be sacrosanct, uh, mean, un meaning untouchable. Uh, and uh, so they had all these different powers, but um, you know, few people ever exercised them to their full extent. Uh, there were also 10 tribunes elected every single year, so that kind of diluted any one tribune's power. Uh, so if there are 10 of you elected each year, uh, each tribune has to share that power with the, uh, with the nine other tribunes. All, all those nine other tribunes could, could veto whatever you want to do or, or things like that. So that kind of kept tribunes from being really too powerful. Um, but uh, Tiberius Gracchus, again, kind of thinking like a radical here, not only did he... Uh, win election as tribune of the plebs, which was, uh, you know, usually reserved for plebeians. Um, he also uh, decided to exercise some of those ancient powers of the tribune that had not been, um, you know, had not been used before. Uh, and so one of the ancient powers was that any law, so the Tribune of the Plebs was responsible for the Concilium Plebis, the, the Council of the Plebs. And it was the Council of the Plebs that actually passed legislation. So few people know, say, they, they think that the Senate uh, passed legislation in Rome. The Senate actually did not pass legislation. They gave advice. That advice was usually followed, but they made policy basically by just giving advice and by being basically the puppet masters of everything else that was going on. Uh, in ancient Rome, you know, uh, uh, basically, like I said, the same families dominated the high political offices and therefore the same families were in the Senate. So people who held high political office, when they looked at the Senate, they were literally looking at their uncles and their fathers and their grandfathers staring back at them. And so when those people told them, do this, you know, they did that. There was a, there was a great sense of filial piety in Rome, a sense of doing what your father tells you to do. You know, the, the Senate had a great deal of auctoritas, of morally binding authority. Uh, but technically, though, what the Senate said was just advice. While it was mostly followed by these magistrates, because again, they were listening to their fathers and their grandfathers, it didn't have to be followed. And so um, Tiberius Gracchus, already having been humiliated by the Senate, decided to kind of go off on his own. And uh, and so the things that actually did become laws in ancient Rome was what the tribune passed with the Council of the Plebs. So if the tribune proposed a law to the Council of the Plebs and a majority voted for it, it would become a law binding on all Roman citizens. Now, again, the Senate usually controlled this, again, by providing advice to the magistrates uh, and also by, you know, kind of orchestrating uh, other people as tribunes to veto other people and, and so on and so forth. So they usually had a great deal of control over what laws were proposed to the common people, but they had no control over Tiberius. Tiberius decided to come up with a law that he knew the Senate would hate, but the common people would love. He saw that the wealthy senatorial class, mostly senators, were, were buying up these, these farms and uh, uh, were kicking people off their land. And so he decided propose a law to redistribute land, basically, to take up all the land that the rich people bought 
and to redistribute it amongst the working class and poor, poor people. So that was his law. Uh, so he wanted to propose this law uh, to the common people. However, uh, there was a fellow tribune, Octavius, again, probably being chored by the Senate here, who vetoed uh, Tiberius's law proposal. Any tribune can veto somebody else's uh, uh, proposal, which is one of the ways that the Senate and the, the wealthy classes can control what happened in the Roman government. Um, so Tiberius takes this even a step further. So you got to see how radical Tiberius was. You know, first of all, just running for tribune of the plebs, you know, giving up his patrician, of the, uh, patrician status and running for tribune of the plebs. Then uh, enacting, proposing a law uh, that he knew the Senate would hate, but that the people would love. And now thirdly, now that he seems to have reached another dead end, like, like Tiberius is one of those guys who doesn't take no for an answer, right? Uh, when one of his fellow tribunes vetoes him, Tiberius decides to shut down government, to basically veto everything, uh, almost causing a riot. You know, garbage was dumped on Octavius's head and he had to be pulled off the speaker's platform. And so with, with, Tiber with Octavius not there to veto Tiberius, Tiberius was then able to propose and pass his land redistribution law. So uh, again, you see all the kind of extreme steps that Tiberius is taking. And that final extreme step of deciding, well, if Octavius is going to veto me, I'm going to veto everything. So the word veto, veto vetare in Latin, means to forbid. Uh, the tribune supposedly had the power to forbid anything from happening. So veto literally means I forbid. And so Tiberius, again, decides to veto everything, to shut down the day-to-day -day operations of government and almost cause a riot. And in doing that, get rid of his political enemies and, uh, and pass the laws that he wants passed. Uh, so uh, his... Land redistribution law was passed. Um, however, you know, uh, uh, it, it wasn't hugely successful. Uh, some of the people in the commission who were supposed to be responsible for, for seizing land and redistributing it, uh, you know, were slow to do that. Uh, the Senate, which controlled, you know, the Treasury, uh, was slow to help finance, you know, this law. So everybody was basically dragging their feet with this law. So Tiberius was able to get the law passed, but not too much really became of it. However, at this time, uh, the Senate was obviously very angry with Tiberius. You know, he seemed to be flaunting all of the old traditions of the Republic. And, uh, when you held an office in Rome, a political office in Rome, the political office only lasted for one year. So you got to think of how, what a highly politicized place Rome was. You know, we have big elections maybe every two years or every four years in America. And, uh, uh, you know, and people are always, by, by the end of a, an election cycle, people are always sick of all of the different, you know, mudslinging and different things that happen in American elections. Imagine going through that every single year. So big elections happen in Rome every single year, and Tiberius' uh, term of office was only one year long. Uh, and it was interesting in Rome, uh, this thing called quaestiones, that you couldn't be prosecuted for crimes while you held a political office. So as long as he was tribune, nobody, he was, uh, like I said before, sacrosanctitas, he was untouchable. Nobody could prosecute him for crimes. Uh, and the Senate hated him. They were ready to prosecute him for all kinds of crimes, bring him up on all kinds of charges and end his political career, possibly force him into exile. Um, so, uh, so Tiberius came up with another novel idea, another radical idea. He was going to run for re-election as Tribune of the Plebs. So that is another thing that really wasn't allowed in Roman government. Uh, you know, the whole Roman constitution, not that there was a written constitution, but the constitution, the, the, the organization of government, the way that things have already always operated. Um, it was illegal to run for the same office two years in a row. The whole idea behind the Republic was to stop anybody from becoming too powerful. And they felt if you were able to run for re-election again and again to the same office, you would become too powerful. Uh, so uh, in, in none of the office were you allowed to 
offices in Rome were you allowed to run for the same office two years in a row. You could run for a higher office the next year if you wanted to. But again, remember, all of those offices were closed off to Tiberius. So uh, Tiberius decided to illegally run for re-election the Tribune of the Plebs to keep himself in office so that he wouldn't be prosecuted by his political enemies. Uh, it was during this re-election campaign that uh, senators themselves basically took a bunch of clubs, sometimes made out of, some, some people say made out of the wood of the benches in the Senate House, uh, led by one of the senators named N Nasica. Uh, so they took clubs, the Latin word for clubs is fustes, and they rushed out uh, uh, in, in kind of, uh, at Tiberius while he was running for re-election, uh, and a fight broke out, and targeting Ti Tiberius specifically, Tiberius was beaten to death. So he was literally beaten to death by the senators themselves. All right, so that is actually not the end of the Gracchi brothers. Uh, Tiberius had a younger brother named Gaius Sempronius Gracchus. Uh, Gaius, uh, you know, obviously grew up in the shadow of his older brother doing all these radical things. And Gaius basically followed in the footsteps of his older brother. Uh, so he renounced his patrician status and ran as tribune of the plebs. And the Senate, probably feeling bad for having killed his older brother with clubs, you know, bludgeoning him to death, they actually allowed Gaius to run as tribune of the plebs two years in a row, which, like I said, was illegal. But, uh, uh, but again, people felt bad that, you know, Tiberius was bludgeoned to death. So Gaius, um, you know, ran two years in a row as tribune of the plebs. And during that time, he kind of upped to the ante. Uh, he uh, uh, didn't just re-propose a land redistribution bill, but he proposed several bills that the, the Senate hated and that the people loved. Uh, first of all, restriction on taxes. Like, who doesn't love lower taxes? So Ty Gaius Gracchus says, you know, we're going to lower everybody's taxes. Uh, then uh, he said that we're going to subsidize people's grain. So the grain, the you know, what people eat in Rome, uh, you know, if the market price for it was, say, you know, uh, you know, a denarius or something, uh, the government would pay, let's say, half of that. So the government was now going to subsidize the grain um, in ancient Rome. Uh, this is actually one step towards making the grain absolutely free and the government paying for all of it, uh, but we're not quite there yet. So he, he uh, proposed the government paying for part of people's grain. Uh, and again, this is, uh, some people think of this as kind of like a welfare uh, kind of policy of uh, of the late republic, but it wasn't. It, it was basically um, a privilege of all Roman citizens. So it didn't matter if you were wealthy or poor or whatever. Everybody would have their grain subsidized. Uh, like I said, he readopted Tiberius's a redistribution law of uh, redistributing people's land. And he also pushed for a lot of public works projects. So why are public works projects something that would make him more popular? Uh, because it provided people with, with jobs and it made beautiful you know, monuments in Rome. So when a new temple was built or when a new basilica was built or, or whatever, when a new bridge was built, it was both providing people with jobs and uh, you know, bettering the look of the city, uh, both of which would be then attributed to Gaius Gracchus, making him more popular. Um, so there were two, so a lot of these things, a lot of these laws, you know, Gaius didn't meet with as much resistance as his brother did. Uh, again, probably because the Senate felt bad for bludgeoning his older brother to death. Uh, so, uh, but there were two big things that kind of came up uh, that the Senate did resist fiercely. One of them was an area called Pergamum. So Pergamum is in where modern day Turkey is or the Romans called Asia Minor. Uh, that area, uh, the king died in Pergamum and left a whole bunch of land to the Roman government. Uh, the Senate wanted to basically control that land and distribute, them how, distribute it how they saw fit. Gaius Gracchus wanted to seize that land as part of the land redistribution plan and to give that land away to his own supporters, I guess you would say, or to the working class. And so, uh, um, so there was a big conflict between that, what to do with the land uh, that the Roman government, that fell on the Roman government's lap in, in Pergamum. However, a bigger uh, issue that came up, what kept the senators awake at night, what is something known as the Italian question. Uh, 
So at this point in Roman history, uh, the city of Rome itself, citizens in the city of Rome are allowed to vote, uh, along with a couple other colonies here and there in different areas uh, in Italy that, that the Romans had granted citizenship to for one reason or another. But a majority of the Italian peninsula were not yet full Roman citizens. They, many of them did not yet really have the right to vote in Roman elections. So Gaius Gracchus proposed to extend suffrage, extend the right to vote to all male citizens uh, in the Italian peninsula. Um, and um, so it's kind of interesting that not everybody in the Italian peninsula at this time had the right to vote, even though at this time Rome had already expanded to a, a larger empire, but they didn't. And Gaius Gracchus proposed to give them the right to vote to everybody in the Italian peninsula. And what the senators feared was that if Gaius Gracchus gave all of the Italians the right to vote, well, they would vote for him then. All right, like, like he'd be unstoppable. He'd have such a large group of supporters that, that he could basically make himself the most powerful man in Rome. And, and so that's one of the things that the senators feared. You know, there's debates today about, you know, immigration and uh, providing licenses and stuff to, to illegal immigrants or to, um, uh, to undocumented immigrants and things. And um, uh, one of the fears that the GOP always brings up is that, you know, Democrats are just trying to get uh, people who shouldn't vote the ability to vote. And, and if these people uh, receive citizenship and receive a right to vote, that they'll always just vote Democrat. Uh, and so a similar debate, a similar argument uh, kind of uh, arose here where the Senate feel, feared that if Gaius Gracchus gave the right to vote to all of the Italians, that they would always just vote for him. Um, so uh, Gaius Gracchus uh, was pushing through these initiatives uh, while he was trying to also run for a third year as tribune. And supposedly he lost election, uh, the, his third year as tribune, uh, just in the middle of doing all these things. And, uh, you know, he claimed that the elections were rigged, uh, uh, that, that it wasn't proper, and, and, and uh, uh, he basically held a protest uh, after the elections, on the Aventine Hill. The Aventine Hill is usually where the uh, more working class and poorer Romans lived. Uh, and during this protest, the Senate issued what's called a Senatus Consultum Automatum. Uh, so we use that word automatum in English sometimes, an automatum, something that somebody tells you, do this or else. Senatus Consultum Automatum means the final advice of the Senate the most extreme advice of the Senate. And so remember, I said the Senate doesn't really pass legislation. They basically just give advice. And so a Senatus Consultum Automatum, this, this extreme advice of the Senate, basically told the consul. So remember, the consul was the highest office in the Roman Republic. The consul was the one who was in charge of the military. Um, they told the consul to use any means necessary to put down this protest of Gaius Gracchus. And so... With Tiberius Gracchus, Tiberius Gracchus was killed uh, in basically a, a riot that broke out and, and senators, you know, themselves targeting Gaius Gracchus with, with clubs. Gaius Gracchus, on the other hand, was killed by the Roman military. So the Roman military marched up the Aventine Hill and targeted Gaius Gracchus and killed Tar Gaius Gracchus. So those were the Gracchi brothers. And uh, even though both of them, you know, seemingly were unsuccessful in, in many of their initiatives, they basically opened up a, a whole huge deal, or, or they, they exposed a whole huge deal of pressures that, that were pressuring the Roman government. Um, there would be a new split now between Roman politicians. Uh, instead of, uh, you know, the wealthier classes kind of uniting uh, to preserve the Republic, uh, wealthier Romans, patrician families, would break apart and fight against each other. And uh, some patrician families would be more of the traditional kind. Um, they, they referred to themselves as the optimates, the optimates, the best people. Uh, and other politicians 
uh, would try to fight for the working class, the middle class, the working class. They referred to themselves as populari. So they, they would follow in the footsteps of like the Gracchi brothers. So the Gracchi brothers showed basically that there was a whole new way to play politics. You didn't just have to use the old traditional ways of playing politics of, you know, making alliances with the uh, most aristocratic families uh, and working your way up the, uh, that political ladder. Um, but you can make yourself powerful simply by your popularity with the common people. Now, a lot of people think of these as political parties, the optimates and the populares, uh, as a more conservative and more liberal uh, a political party. Uh, that really isn't the case, though. Uh, optimates and populares doesn't really refer to particular people. Uh, it more refers to p particular strategies, uh, uh, tactics that are used to gain political power. Because you'll see many politicians actually using both. Sometimes when it, when, uh, it seems like a, a good idea, they'll use optimates tactics and make alliances with powerful political families and use old traditional ways of gaining power. And sometimes when it seems to suit them better, uh, they'll switch to populares tactics where they'll, they'll uh, uh, use their popularity with the common people or with the military uh, to make themselves more powerful. So think, it's a better idea to think of this less as, as political parties and more as um, different tactics or strategies. And while some politicians lean more to one side or lean more to the other side, both of these tactics are used by, by many of the politicians we'll see in the late Republic. Another issue that came up with the Gracchi brothers is that question of quaestiones. So quaestiones were these, uh, you know, basically prosecuting people for crimes. And you remember that uh, the Gracchi brothers could not be prosecuted for crimes while they were holding political office. Uh, but many of the senators and many of the Roman, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, many people wanted to prosecute them for crimes as soon as they lost the protection of their political office, so as soon as their term ended. But the negative effect that this had was that um, they it, it caused these people who knew that they were going to be prosecuted to go to extreme means and extra legal means to maintain their their political office, maintain their political office their, uh, uh, to be reelected. You saw that with Tiberius Gracchus trying to get reelected a second time, even though it was illegal. Uh, Gaius Gracchus actually successfully was elected twice and then tried to be elected a third time. Uh, and so, um, the again, the negative consequence of not being able to prosecute somebody for crimes until after they're done in office uh, compels uh, those office holders who know that they're going to be prosecuted for crimes to want to hold office longer than they should. Uh, so that uh, is a, an additional pressure that was exposed by the Gracchi brothers. Uh, and then the Senatus Consultum Automatum. Uh, this, this whole idea... So this can be laid right at the foot of basically the senators themselves of introducing violence into the political system. Once you introduce physical violence into the political system, it's hard to get rid of it. Um, so the senators first bludgeon Tiberius Gracchus to death, like physically beat him to death. So, I mean, they, they, they couldn't seem to, uh, uh, to bring him down politically, so they resorted to physical violence. And then they took it a step further with Gaius Gracchus and used the actual military, declared basically the, the equivalent of martial law in order to put down Gaius Gracchus. And so that introduction of violence into the political system and this whole idea of SCU and martial law, um, that is initiated here with the Gracchi brothers and the Senate, um, and it won't go away. For quite some time. So once you introduce the violence, it's hard to get rid of it. And finally, um, the unresolved Italian question. One of the big questions that uh, Gracchi, uh, Gaius Gracchus, you know, put forth was to give citizenship to the Italians. And so the Italians were actually looking forward to having full Roman citizenship and being able to vote in Roman elections. And then as soon as Gaius Gracchus died, that seemed to be taken right away from them. So that's going to cause further issues down the line. All right, so we then move to a newer generation of Romans. After the death of the Gracchi brothers, 
uh, trouble began to brew for the Romans down in North Africa. Uh, remember, North Africa is where Carthage is. And the um, basically, uh, one of the, the key uh, nations to help the Romans against the Carthaginians uh, were the Numidians. So one of the kings named Massinissa uh, helped the Romans and provided cavalry to Scipio Africanus uh, to defeat the Carthaginians during the Second Punic War and remained a staunch ally of the Romans uh, from that point on. Uh, so Massinissa had several sons and one adopted son named Jugurtha. Uh, when Massinissa died, uh, Jugurtha basically forced his other brothers um, basically to relinquish their um, claim to power. He basically you know, put them down one by one uh, and consolidated power just completely for himself. Uh, when these brothers complained to the Romans uh, what Jugurtha was doing, uh, the Romans sent down a commission. Now, Jugurtha, um, you know, as a young man, had served with the Romans, and he knew that the Roman army was a difficult army to defeat in the battlefield. Uh, the best way to defeat the Roman army was to not fight it at all, but rather to bribe the commanders uh, in the Roman army. So Jugurtha bribed the commanders who came down to investigate, you know, whether what he was doing was right uh, against his brothers. And the commanders turned around and, and found in favor of Jugurtha uh, that he was doing everything fine down there. Uh, you know, the, the Roman citizenry back in Rome could see right through this. They, they saw that Jugurtha was bribing the people who were supposed to be, uh, you know, protecting Roman interests down in North Africa. And so Jugurtha was even called into Rome at one point. Uh, to answer for charges of bribery. And he actually bribed his way out of that as well. So Jugurtha has consolidated power in North Africa and has bribed his way out of getting into any trouble with the Romans. And the common Roman people, you know, really want somebody to go down to North Africa and show Jugurtha who's boss. And so the, the Romans eventually... Uh, send uh, somebody named Caecilius Metellus, so Quintus Caecilius Metellus, down to put down Jugurtha. And Metellus, you know, was unimpeachable. He, he couldn't be bribed. And so Jugurtha, realizing that he can't bribe Metellus, decided, again, not to engage him in, in any direct warfare, but basically to hide out in the mountains, to perhaps wage a guerrilla campaign against Metellus. Um, so Metellus is down in, in North Africa, uh, trying to uh, get hold of uh, Jugurtha here. And um, uh, he's having a hard time of it, and people back in Rome are maybe even complaining that he too is being bribed, even though he's not. He's not taking any bribes, he's just having a hard time tracking Jugurtha down. Unfortunately for Metellus, he had kind of a disgruntled officer, a younger officer in his army, a guy by the name of Gaius Marius. And so Gaius Marius basically was a young officer that thought that he could do a better job than Metellus. So, I mean, Gaius Marius was brought there because, you know, he had allied himself with Metellus. You know, Metellus was helping him rise up in his political career. But sitting there in North Africa and being unable to track down Jugurtha, Marius thought that he could do a better job than Metellus. And so he decided to, you know, relax the discipline a little amongst his own soldiers and to have his own soldiers kind of write home to tell, you know, the, the, the Romans back home, uh, you know, if Marius was in charge of this army, he would have caught Jugurtha by now. And so Marius uh, then basically left back to Rome to run for consul in 107 BC so that he could um, take charge of the army and uh, uh, defeat, uh, uh, defeat Jugurtha. Um, and he won election. You know, again, all those letters back home seem to have helped him. Uh, and you could see with Gaius Marius here, so Gaius Marius is going to become very important. You could see with Gaius Marius here that he's both using Optimate's tactics by allying himself first with the Metellus family. That's how he got to North Africa to begin with. And also using popularity tactics by trying to make himself popular back at home with the common people and with his army uh, in order to be elected consul. And so Marius was elected consul here. And uh, at first the Senate did not want to give him 
uh, command of uh, the war against Jugurtha. But again, he used the Tribune of the Plebs. Remember, anything that the Tribune of the Plebs uh, basically um, proposes to the common people and a majority of them vote on uh, has the rule of law. So he uses tribunes to make sure that he has the command that he wants, the command against Jugurtha. So he goes off to take charge of the army against Jugurtha, and his former friend, Metellus, is recalled back to Rome. Uh, when Marius gets to um, North Africa, he actually has a hard time himself of tracking down Jugurtha. It wasn't as easy as he thought it would be. But lucky for Marius... He has a gifted young officer under his command, a guy by the name of Lucius Cornelius Sulla. And so Sulla basically kind of goes undercover and convinces Jugurtha's father-in-law, Bocchus, to betray Jugurtha. So that when Jugurtha comes over to dinner one night, you know, to his father-in-law's house, some Roman soldiers just like jump out of the closet and grab Jugurtha. I mean, that's not exactly how it went, but Bocchus betrays Jugurtha to the Romans. And this was engineered by a young officer named Lucius Cornelius Sulla. So, uh, so Marius comes home in triumph. You know, Marius uh, uh, took charge of the army and did what Metellus or nobody before him could do. He captured Jugurtha. And uh, um, one of the things that Marius does when he goes back home in triumph and, you know, succeeding in doing what he said he would do, uh, is he doesn't give that much credit to Sulla. Remember, it was Sulla, his younger officer, who engineered uh, Bocchus capturing Jugurtha. And uh, this begins a rift between the two men. So Marius and Sulla are not too friendly after this. Um, but um, but at, at this point, Marius is kind of at a high point in his career. He had won election to council, and, um, and he had done what he said he would do with the help of Sulla, who he didn't give much credit to. Um, and luckily for Marius again, when he comes back to Rome, there is another big threat, and this one a big existential threat, uh, to the Romans that the Romans are facing just as Marius is coming back. It appears some German tribes have crossed over into northern Italy and are threatening uh, you know, Italian cities and, and provinces. And so Gaius Marius uh, remains consul uh, in charge of the army and puts in some major reforms in the army so that he could win this military glory of defeating the Germans. So now that we're talking about Gaius Marius, because Gaius Marius is basically going to remain consul because of this threat of the Germans. He's going to remain consul for year after year after year. And if you remember what I said before, that's illegal. You know, he, you were only supposed to be consul for one year. Uh, you weren't supposed to run for office two years in a row. Uh, but Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus showed that you could do that uh, as tribune of the plebs. Uh, you know, uh, obviously they, they, they died for it, but they, they still kind of pushed the limits there. And Gaius Marius is going to take that idea and bring it up to the highest office in the Roman Republic, the consulship. So who is this Gaius Marius that's going to have such a profound effect, uh, uh, impact in this late Republican period? Well, he wasn't from one of those patrician families. He was from an equestrian family, which is one of the more upper middle class families in Rome. Uh, and, um, you know, he worked his way up the political career. Uh, he basically used, like I said, optimates tactics by marrying into the Metelli family and using the, the Metelli family. The Metelli family was one of these old patrician families, using his connections with the Metelli family to rise up the political ladder. Again, it was the Metelli family, the very reason why he was in North Africa during the outbreak of the Jugurthian War to begin with. Um, but you could also see how he uses popularis tactics, how he uses tribunes to get the command that he wants, how he uses his soldiers to write home to g increase his popularity with the common Roman people. Uh, and so he uses both tactics to rise up the political ladder and to gain the consulship. And when he comes back home to Rome uh, from, um, uh, from the Jugurthian War, he's confronted with this other problem, the Germans. So having to deal with these Germans, which vastly outnumber uh, the number of soldiers that the Roman army could put in the field, he decides to, to build up the army and also to reorganize the army. Uh, it shows a lot 
of Gaius Marius's confidence that uh, he felt that he could make changes uh, to a Roman army that had been so successful for generations previous that had won a huge empire for itself. But he was going to make radical changes to this army. And, uh, um, and this is the kind of army that will last in Roman history uh, for generations afterwards. So the changes that Marius makes actually do end up being beneficial. Uh, so one of the first things that he does is the caput agens, which sometimes is translated head count. Uh, he, instead of having land-owning citizens be in the army, in order to get more soldiers in the army to equal the number, or, or at least begin to equal the number of the Germans that he was going to go up against, he decided to be able to enlist any Roman citizen in the army. You didn't have to have a property qualification anymore. You could be working class or poor, uh, but you could join the Roman army as long as you were a Roman citizen. Um, and so you could see immediately how these new soldiers in the army are going to have a lot of loyalty towards Gaius Marius himself. Because without him, uh, they wouldn't have had a job. They wouldn't have had the opportunity to be in the Roman army. Uh, he also, instead of making it an army kind of like a volunteer reserve thing for landowning people who you know would do that in the summer months and then would go back to their farms, um, he made the army a professional career. So you could be a working class or poorer Roman and you would join the army for 25 years and you could also work your way up the ranks so that you could become a centurion, an optio, uh, uh, you know, a, a primus pilum, uh, like, we, uh, like we've talked about before, a first spear centurion or, or whatever. Uh, you could work your way up the officer ranks in the army. So he made more of a career job out of being in the Roman army. So you can see here how he's kind of professionalizing the Roman army, reorganizing it, uh, making it a career for 25 years, uh, giving people the opportunity to work up uh, uh, to higher ranks in the Roman army again, which makes the army uh, more loyal to him because he's the one doing all these things, giving them opportunities that uh, people wouldn't have had before. And you got to remember, these are people who don't own their own property. So before in the Roman army, uh, the the landowners would, would be responsible for much of their own, own equipment. But these new soldiers being enlisted in the army uh, can't afford any of their own equipment. So Marius buys all their equipment for them, which, uh, which again makes them more loyal. Here's Marius buying all their stuff for them. Uh, but also... Um, it, you know, it, it standardizes their equipment so that all of the different soldiers in the army have you know, the same kind of standard equipment. Um, and finally, one of the things, well, he does a bunch of other things too. Uh, rather than having, using that old phalanx formation that we talked about when we were talking about the Roman military where the first person would fight uh, as hard as they could forever uh, and... Um, and the last person really didn't have much to do in, in a Roman phalanx or in a Greek phalanx. Uh, he's the one who came up with the idea of rotating soldiers, where we talked about before, where the first person would only fight for a few minutes and then rotate to the back. And so they'd have a fresh fighter fighting in the front uh, as much as possible. So Gaius Marius is the one who came up with that idea of rotating soldiers uh, through the lines rather than just having it be stagnant. Um, and finally, one of the other things that Marius did with his soldiers was he made them carry their own stuff. So, um, unlike you would think, though, this actually made them faster. Why do you think it made them faster? It made them faster because, first of all, they didn't have a bunch of slaves and, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a large baggage train carrying their stuff for them, people who are untrained and, and you know, uh, uh, basically just doing it in carts and things like that. So the Roman army could just move around by itself with just its soldiers without some huge baggage train following it, which would slow it down. Secondly, uh, a Roman soldier carried anywhere between 80 and maybe 110 pounds of gear uh, on a regular basis. And so as they're marching around with all of this gear on their back, they're becoming physically stronger. So Marius's soldiers, Marius's army, becomes physically stronger because it's able to carry all of the stuff. And so, therefore, are able to carry it faster as well. And so Marius has, has kind of reorganized this whole army. Uh, you know, he's the one who invented that rotating through the lines. Uh, he allows, you know, the common people, the headcount, to join the army. 
Uh, he standardizes their equipment and uh, he co- forces them to carry their own equipment, which makes them stronger and faster. Now, the other senators kind of made fun of Marius's army, calling them Marius's mules, like he was treating his soldiers like a bunch of mules carrying their own stuff. But like I said, it made them faster and it made them stronger. Um, we'll get to Sulla uh, a little bit later. Uh, so uh, he actually does this over a series of years. Like I said, Marius took that idea of running illegally for election the next year and the next year and the next year and took that up to the highest office in the Roman Republic, the consulship. And he would actually end up serving five consecutive consulships and seven total consulships uh, uh, in total by the end of his life. Uh, an unheard of uh, occurrence that, that somebody would serve five consulships in a row. Now, why did the Roman people allow him to serve five consulships in a row? Well, because there was that threat of the Germans. Uh, the Germans were threatening northern Italy, but they hadn't quite broken in yet. So, so th- they were up there, but, uh, you know, Marius couldn't deal with them yet. He, he had all of these years to kind of reform and train the army uh, and um, without having to confront the Germans. Eventually, though, the Germans, the, the Kimberi tribe, broke into Italy and... Uh, um, Basically, Marius was able to put this this newly trained and reformed army into use, and it ended up being spectacularly successful. I mean, it defeated uh, uh, two vast groups of Germans that that outnumbered them by a huge amount, and so uh, Marius was able to defeat uh, the Kimbri tribe. They split themselves into two, and Marius defeated both groups, and basically uh, uh, forced them back into Germany. And uh, was at the high point of his career. He seemed like the savior of all of Italy. Uh, he was called the savior of Rome, and uh, was often uh, was also given the title of the third founder of Rome. Uh, so uh, uh, th- that being kind of a significant title, like like puts him on an equal footing with Romulus himself, the founder of Rome. So the first founder is obviously Romulus. The second founder was actually a general named Camillus, uh, way back during uh, the early uh, Republic and the the battles against the Veii. Um, and so, uh, Marius is given that title of the third founder of Rome, uh, because of his success against the Cimbri. However, after Marius' um, uh, military um, successes, uh, once he settled in to, to finish his fifth year, his fifth consecutive year as consul, um, he found out that uh, being just a basic politician um, was... Uh, was a little harder than than doing all those things that he was doing with the army. Now that he had to pay attention to just the political goings on in Rome, um, you know he he wasn't that successful. And after that that fifth consecutive consulship, he he decides to retire from public life and put himself into kind of a, a self imposed exile. Um, however, that's not the end of Marius. There, uh, Marius. Um, uh, another war breaks out in Italy uh, shortly after Marius puts himself in exile, uh, something called the Social War. If you remember, one of the lingering issues with the Gracchi brothers was that the Italians um, basically were not given the citizenship that, they, that was kind of dangled in front of them. And so many Italian, in many areas of Italy revolted against Rome. They rebelled against Rome and, and they tried to kind of break away and form their own uh, kind of government, uh, which, which was modeled on the Roman government. But, uh, um, uh, but they decided, you know, if, if you don't want us as full citizens, we're going to kind of break away. Uh, in a way, it was just kind of, um, uh, like I said, a response to being denied that citizenship. It's, it's one of the more interesting wars in history as the rebelling side really wanted less to rebel and more to really be a fully-fledged part of Rome. Uh, and so the, the different city-states around Rome rebelled against it, and Rome, one by one, in a bloody and costly war, had to bring them back into their back under Roman control. However, it, interestingly, when the Romans brought them under control, uh, they granted them the full citizenship. That uh, um, that they wanted in the first place. So perhaps some, uh, you know, 
uh, more compromise earlier on could have avoided this bloody and costly war. Um, in the end, though, um, Marius returned to public service as one of the generals during the Social War. I mean, now that there was a war going on, he wanted to do, kind of be back, back in it again. Uh, however, Marius was not the hero of the Social War. The, the young man that seemed like the up-and-comer rising star during the Social War was not Marius, but his old lieutenant, Lucius Cornelius Sulla. So it's time we take a moment and talk about Sulla and Marius. So Sulla uh, was a member of a, a wealthy patrician family. And um, uh, like I said, he kind of felt disgruntled when Marius did not give him enough credit for capturing Jugurtha in that first war. Uh, and so Sulla, uh, you know, continues to rise up the political ranks and uh, again was seen as the star during those social wars. And immediately after the end of the social wars, it seems like Rome can't catch a break here, um, there is a king named Mithridates uh, out in Asia Minor. I remember Asia Minor was that area where Pergamum was, but this is another area of Asia Minor. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a big peninsula. Uh, and this king Mithridates is seen as the one last king that could maybe fight against the Romans and maybe free a lot of Greek cities uh, from Roman domination. Um, and so Mithridates seems to have a lot of support. And in 88 BC, uh, Mithridates, um, in, in kind of a, uh, it was amazing that he was able to keep this a secret. In the same day, he massacred uh, Roman citizens throughout the areas that uh, he was in charge of. So the Roman citizens back in Rome um, wanted uh, a terrible revenge against Mithridates. He had killed all these Roman citizens living in Asia Minor and living throughout Greece uh, uh, in, in kind of a genocidal slaughter uh, uh, that occurred over just like a single day. And so the Romans back in Rome wanted to send their best general and put down Mithridates. And their best general at the time was Sulla. Sulla had risen up as the rising star during the social wars. Um, but Mithridates was such a hated figure back in Rome that lots of people wanted to be in command of the army that would put down Mithridates, including Marius. So Marius is getting kind of uh, uh, older here, but... but he wants, again, the glory for himself uh, to go up against such a hated figure as Mithridates and, and to defeat him. Maybe one last great military victory for Marius. So Marius goes to his old tricks again and gets uh, a tribune named Rufus to propose to the people that to take Sulla uh, away of, from power and, and put Marius into power. Um, unfortunately for Marius, so, so the, the tribune does this. But unfortunately for Marius, when when Sulla hears about this, when 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 Sulla gets to his army, the army, you know, uh, seems to be loyal to Sulla, and Sulla, when he hears that Marius is the one who's going to be in charge of the army now, doesn't give up command of his army like Metellus did way back during the Jugurthine War. He instead decides to command his army turn his army of Rome, uh, around and march it on Rome. So Sulla attacks Rome with his own Roman army uh, because he was going to be removed from power and Marius was going to be put back into power. And Marius, at this point, ends up having to flee Rome. Um, and then Sulla, after you know getting Marius to flee and putting himself concretely back into power, uh, back in charge of the army, he turns the army around again and marches against Mithridates, like he was supposed to do to begin with. Uh, once Sulla leaves with his army and goes against Mithridates, Marius sneaks back into Rome and uh, gets the tribune to uh, uh, basically say that, Mari that Sulla is an enemy of the people and, and uh, uh, to basically begin uh, killing anybody who might be a supporter of Sulla. Um, 
Marius, like I said at this time, though, is getting up there in age, and eventually he dies. You know, he, he runs for a seventh consulship, but he doesn't make it all the way through his seventh consulship. He just dies of old age. But still, the people in charge in Rome are the people who were Sola supporters. Uh, chief among them was a guy named Cinna. So Cinna was uh, uh, one of these guys who is um, Marius's supporters, and they're in control at Rome. And they've declared Sulla an enemy of the people and things like that. So Sulla, in the meantime, remember, Sulla is off fighting Mithridates. And uh, he's fighting in Greece, and, and he's fighting Mithridates, and he's having some success. Um, but then once he hears from people running away from Rome, uh, his old supporters, that Marius is in charge of Rome, uh, Sulla again breaks off his fight with Mithridates, comes to a quick peace agreement with Mithridates, so basically that Mithridates can remain king, uh, over in Asia Minor, as long as he stops killing Romans uh, and goes back to Asia Minor. Um, so Sulla comes to a quick peace agreement with Mithridates and then turns his army around again to march it on Rome again and to put down the supporters of, of Gaius Marius. Um, this is a good example of how this conflict between fellow Romans, this conflict between Sulla and Marius, uh, kind of takes away from the Romans fighting their real enemies. So they're too busy fighting each other uh, uh, that, that it takes away, you know, Sulla could have defeated Mithridates in Greece and he could have put away this, this enemy uh, of the Romans that the Romans hated so much. Instead, he comes to a quick peace agreement with him because he has to turn around and, and fight Marius some more. And uh, uh, Mithridates will come back later. To, uh, to haunt the Romans, to, to be a thorn in the Roman side. Uh, so Mithridates uh, goes back to Pontus, quick peace agreement with, with Sulla, and Sulla takes his Roman army and then marches it towards the city of Rome again to attack the city of Rome and all those people in Rome that are Marius' supporters that snuck back into Rome. So Marius himself by this time is dead, but Marius' supporters are in, are in control of Rome. As Sulla marches towards Rome with his army, uh, many of his supporters flock to his side. Uh, and two young men in particular, uh, Crassus and Pompey. So Crassus and Pompey will be very important in a later generation. So Marcus Crassus and uh, um, Pompey, who will eventually be known as Pompey the Great, um, Gnaeus Pompey is his, is his first name, uh, basically form armies on their own. Again, this is kind of why people call this kind of like a warlord period in, in Rome, where, where anybody with money or with influence can kind of just gather their own army. So they, they form their own armies on their own, and they join forces with Sulla as he comes marching on Rome to defeat uh, the Marians who are in charge of Rome. Uh, Sulla fights a big battle in front of the gates of Rome called the Battle of the Colline Gates. Crassus... Uh, the young man who came to help Sulla out with his own army, is instrumental in winning this battle, the, ba uh, the Battle of the Colline Gates. So this is kind of a big military victory for Crassus, one of the, the things that will kind of elude him later in his life. Um, so he wins a, a big military victory at the Battle of the Colline Gates, and Sulla marches into Rome and takes control of Rome. And then Sulla declares himself dictator without restrictions. So what was a dictator? A dictator was an office within the Republic, which was meant only for emergencies. Remember, the Roman Republic always had two consuls in charge of the army and in charge of the government. Uh, that way, n neither of those consuls would try to become too powerful. Uh, so even when Marius was consul, he always had a co-consul uh, governing with him. Um, so there were always two co-councils, but in times of emergencies, uh, the Senate could elevate one of those councils to the position of dictator, who would have emergency powers, because sometimes when you're in an, in an emergency, you can't have two people arguing over what to do. So one of those two councils would be elevated to the position of dictator. And, and a dictator was only supposed to hold office for six months or until the crisis was over, whichever ended sooner. Uh, so, uh, uh, so a dictator had a very strict time limit on it. But what Sulla did was he made himself dictator uh, uh, once he marched into Rome, and uh, there was no time limit on his dictatorship. He could be dictator for as long as he wanted. So he got this unrestricted dictatorship. So there are a lot of things that a generation later 
Julius Caesar is going to do and people think, oh my God, it's crazy that Julius Caesar marched his army on Rome or it's crazy that Julius Caesar wanted to make himself dictator for life. But it's not like those were original ideas of Julius Caesar's at the time. Uh, they had happened a generation earlier with uh, Sulla. Sulla marched on Rome twice and Sulla now made himself dictator without restrictions. So he made himself a dictator. And then he came up with this idea of proscription lists. Proscription lists were basically hit lists. He made a list of his political enemies, which he then nailed to the, uh, uh, posted in the forum. And uh, people would see the names of Sulla's political enemies, and then it became legally okay to kill those people. So any Roman citizen could then kill a person who's prescribed on the list and bring their head into Sulla and get paid by Sulla. So this was a way for Sulla to get rid of his political enemies, the people who still supported Marius, and it was a way for him to get more money because he would then seize the property of the, the prescribed person. Um, sometimes people uh, would just hide out in the forum. You know, assassins would hide out in the forum, and if they saw somebody who, who read their own name on the prescription list, they would jump out and kill that person right there so that they could uh, claim the bounty uh, on that person's head. So it was a, a, a scary and dangerous time to be living in, in Rome where your name could end up on a prescription list at any time and uh, you know your neighbor could kill you and bring your head in for money. Um, and then Sulla uh, put together a whole bunch of laws which were going to make it harder to rise to power the same way, basically, that he and... Um, and uh, Marius did. Uh, he didn't want tribunes to really have any power anymore. He wanted to make sure that people followed all the steps in the cursus honorum, uh, the, the course of honors, the, the ladder of political offices that you had to hold in order to be consul. Uh, so he wanted to make it a slower process. And, uh, and he also doubled the size of, of many of the magistracies. So instead of uh, 10 tribunes being elected every year, there were 20 tribunes elected each year. Uh, instead of, you know, 300 senators, there were 600 senators. So he doubled the size of everything to dilute everybody's power. So now that Sulla was completely in control of everything, um, he wanted to make sure that nobody else had nearly uh, uh, could threaten his power at all. Um, during this time, uh, again, the, uh, there are three people that are rising to power that are going to become uh, important in the next generation. So Marcus Crassus, who I said, you know, had put together his own army and joined Sulla to march on Rome and was instrumental in winning the battle of, of Colline Gates and, and handing Rome over to Sulla. Um, Marcus Crassus uh, ended up uh, uh, becoming super rich uh, during this time. Uh, Cicero uh, uh, is going to rise up in the, in the law courts and Pompey, uh, uh, the other young man who put an army together and joined Sulla to, mar uh, to march against Rome, uh, Pompey's going to be sent off through Italy uh, to basically um, uh, basically uh, kill any Marian supporters that are left. And, um, uh, you know, one, at one point when he was um, basically attacking a town that still supported Marius, uh, the people complained to the town, you can't do this to us, you know, uh, uh, we, we live in a, 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 it's against the law for you to just randomly kill people. And uh, Pompey said to them, you know, who are you to quote laws to us when we have swords in our hands? So, so Pompey kind of got this reputation of being a butcher. That, that's what he was called at the time, an adulus scentulus carnifex, a teenage butcher, uh, because he was so bloody in repressing anybody who, who was still going against Sulla. Um, and Pompey, again, also got that name, like I said, Magnus, Pompey Magnus, Pompey the Great, during this time. He went up to Sulla and said, you know, I should get a triumph. I've done all of these great things for you. You should call me Pompey the Great in the same way that, you know, Alexander the Great was called Alexander the Great. And Sulla kind of just, you know, uh, uh, almost kind of in a mocking kind of way said, sure, We'll call you Pompey the Great. You'll be Pompey the Great. And, uh, uh, but Pompey took the name, even though Sulla kind of meant it as kind of a mockery. Uh, Pompey took the name, and forever afterwards, he would be known as Pompey the Great. Another young man who was uh, very important and vital in the, in the next generation of, of, of young men is uh, Gaius Julius Caesar. Um, and uh, Caesar, however, 
is the nephew of Gaius Marius. Uh, and so um, he is one of the key people that could be targeted as a um, uh, in these prescription lists. And, and in a way he was. Um, but his family, uh, the, the Julii family, held important uh, religious positions and they used their influence to try to safeguard uh, Julius Caesar, try to try to uh, kind of keep him under the radar of of uh, of Sulla. Uh, we'll get to Caesar uh, a little bit later. Sulla Sulla does have some issues with Caesar, and Caesar does end up having to flee the city of Rome uh, at this time. Um, but uh, um, but but Caesar is another one of these young men we're going to keep an eye on here. Uh, so Sulla, once he put all of these reforms in place, um, and once he put himself in complete control of Rome, he decided to retire uh, from, from public life uh, and basically just go into retirement. Um, he kind of disdainfully kind of uh, marched out of Rome after his retirement. Uh, and in 78 BC, he just died a natural death in retirement. And in his retirement, he said on his, um, well, after his death on his tombstone, he had written on his tombstone that there was no greater friend, no worse enemy. So basically, uh, uh, he's saying that if you were my friend, I was a great friend to you. You wouldn't have had a better friend ever. But if you were my enemy, you wouldn't have had a worse enemy than me. I was totally brutal to you. So that idea of no greater friend, no worse enemy kind of encapsulates uh, a lot of you know, uh, uh, if you think about it, like Roman foreign policy in general, um, but also uh, kind of gives you a sense of uh, Sulla's attitude. Um, so he, after, again, taking complete control of everything, coming up with these prescription lists uh, and um, reforming the government, he retires and then dies. And on his tombstone, it reads, no greater friend, no worse enemy. All right, so now really we're getting into this younger generation that I had mentioned. Uh, Pompey and Crassus were two good friends of Sulla, and they helped Sulla both win the civil wars, and they helped him afterwards round up the rest of Marius' supporters. Uh, in 78 BC, though, when Sulla died, Pompey and Crassus being, you know, one of the more influential men back in Rome, Crassus, who had made himself rich, um, basically began to immediately restore uh, all of the different reforms that, uh, uh, that Sulla had made. Uh, you know, Sulla was kind of like one of those people that's, that was like, uh, do as I say, not as I do. Uh, you know, he wanted to make all these reforms so that nobody could get uh, as much power as he did. Um, but no matter what reforms he made, Nobody could deny the basic facts of his life, how he had used a Roman army against the city of Rome itself, how he had killed his political enemies, so how he used force and uh, uh, an absolute power to gain, you know, more power. Um, and so this, the government, immediately after Sulla's death, began to quickly dismantle those different things that he said people should do so that young people like Pompey and Crassus could do the same thing as Sulla did, uh, quickly rise to power and, uh, uh, and take control themselves. Uh, and again, there's, there's, this, there's this desire for, for uh, military glory. So Pompey and Crassus, even though they were both on Sulla's side, they're kind of competing against each other as well as, uh, as wanting this military glory for themselves. Um, Pompey uh, is first sent against uh, uh, one last general who's one last Marian holdout in Spain. So again, the, the Marian supporters were pretty vast. There were a lot of people who liked Marius. And one of the last generals who was still kind of loyal to Marius had taken over kind of a, a region for himself in Spain. Uh, this general was named Sertorius, and he was a very gifted general. Uh, so Pompey was sent by the Senate against Sertorius to bring Spain back under the, the, the central control of Rome. Again, the, uh, the Romans back in Rome, all being Solon supporters. So, uh, so Pompey is sent back 
assent against this uh, final Marian standout, uh, Sertorius in Spain. Uh, Pompey has a hard time capturing Sertorius. You know, Sertorius, like I said, is a gifted general. Unfortunately for Sertorius, he has a disgruntled lieutenant under him who assassinates him, and that disgruntled lieutenant does not end up being nearly as good of a general as Sertorius was. So, lucky for Pompey, Sertorius himself gets killed by his own people, and uh, Pompey is quickly able to defeat um, uh, Sertorius' replacement and bring Spain back under central uh, Rome's control. Meanwhile, while Pompey's busy trying to track down Sertorius and then ends up lucking out and uh, Sertorius' own man kills him, uh, meanwhile, back in Italy, there's a huge slave revolt that breaks out, uh, sometimes referred to as the Third Servile War. Um, a gladiator by the name of, uh, who we know as Spartacus uh, breaks free from his gladiatorial school in southern Italy and then basically uh, runs amok in southern Italy and frees slaves uh, throughout the different uh, cities of southern Italy. Uh, but he doesn't just free the slaves. He amasses the slaves into a huge army and trains them like gladiators uh, to fight against anything that the Romans send against them. And so the Romans basically send three different armies to put down Spartacus. And all three of them are defeated by Spartacus. At one point, uh, Spartacus is hiding out at Mount Vesuvius, you know, the mountain which, you know, 160 years later will erupt. Uh, but, but it's 160 years before that point. So uh, he's hiding out at Mount Vesuvius, and he actually uses vines to climb down Mount Vesuvius to sneak up on the Roman camp and to, uh, to defeat that first group of Romans that sent against them. Uh, the Romans send two consular armies against him, and he defeats both of them. So Spartacus is having a lot of victory uh, down in southern Italy, and the Romans can't seem to get a handle on him. Uh, at, so at one point, Spartacus wants to uh, uh, try to escape Italy, and he tries to get these Cilician pirates to, uh, uh, to allow his slaves to board ships and, and maybe sail off either to Sicily or to North Africa. Uh, possibly Sicily, because there are a lot of slaves in Sicily. And, and started even a bigger rebellion in Sicily was, was what some people think his, his, uh, his idea was. But he never quite got there. The Cilician pirates betrayed him, and he ended up having to uh, fight his way north again uh, to try to get past the city of Rome and uh, uh, head north to freedom. Um, unfortunately for Spartacus, Crassus is back in Rome, and Crassus, remember, uh, uh, has become this hugely wealthy uh, individual. Let me see. Um, uh, the way that Crassus became wealthy is kind of a, a little underhanded. Uh, Crassus put together a firefighting force, uh, but basically only used them to put out fires that he wanted to be put out. Some people even say they might have even started some fires. So he basically looked at property that he liked, and when the property was on fire, he would arrive there with all his firefighters, and the firefighters would be these big burly men, and, and he'd basically intimidate the owner of the home, the owner of the property, to sell the property to him at a, at a, a very low cost. And, and through this way, by using these, these intimidating firefighters, Crassus was able to amass uh, this, this huge uh, uh, ownership of property. Uh, at, at very little cost to himself. Uh, it, it, of course, if, if the owners refused to sell him the property, he would just let it burn down. They would be left with nothing anyhow. So most of the owners sold them the property, and, and Crassus just uh, accumulated this massive amount of wealth. Uh, and so Crassus was one of the wealthiest men in Rome. Everybody basically owed their rent to Crassus. Uh, Crassus would sometimes leave buildings burned down so that he could raise the rent on his, 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 the properties that he owned already. So Crassus had this huge amount of wealth, and he used it to basically raise his own army once he heard all about all of these things happening with Spartacus. And he, he raised his own army, and then he, he attacked Spartacus with it. When Spartacus was, was left... Uh, with the Cilician pirates, uh, you know, betraying him and having to move north, uh, Crassus took this massive army that he paid for, basically, and attacked Spartacus with it. Now, one small group in his army, uh, one cohort in his army, actually uh, uh, hit a setback against uh, Spartacus and, and, and were forced to retreat against Spartacus. And this is the one time in history where we know that the ancient punishment of decimation was actually used. Crassus used this ancient punishment of decimation for the cohort that ran away, that one out of every 10 
of those um, uh, of those soldiers were randomly selected and then beaten to death by their fellow soldiers to instill discipline uh, in that cohort. I, I, I guess Crassus felt that since he personally paid for the army, he could do whatever he wanted with it. Uh, but you could see how badly he treated kind of his own soldiers, uh, instilling this this harsh punishment, this draconian punishment of decimation on his own army. Uh, so despite you know that one setback of the cohort uh, fleeing from Spartacus's army, Crassus was pretty successful in a major battle against Spartacus of defeating Spartacus. So Crassus defeated Spartacus uh, and the slave army uh, by using that army he basically paid for. Unfortunately for Crassus, though, a small group of that slave army escaped from that final battle and continued to push north. And as they pushed north, um, Pompey just happened to be coming home from Spain, you know, after being victorious against Sertorius. And he basically was able to round up that army, that, 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 that small group of slaves that had, that had escaped from Crassus. He was able to defeat them. Uh, Pompey was. So even though Crassus was the one who spent all the money and fought the battle against Spartacus, he had to share the glory of defeating Spartacus with Pompey. And so this is a point where Crassus and Pompey, even though, again, they were on the same side as Sulla earlier, they really begin to not like each other very much. Crassus feels that Pompey always seems to luck out uh, that Pompey gets all this glory and doesn't seem to have done much for it, where Crassus seems to be doing all this hard work and not getting any personal glory for himself. So you can see again how this competition for glory seems to be causing a schism between Pompey and Crassus here. Um, but uh, after Pompey comes back um, from, uh, uh, from Spain and, and helps Crassus out, you know, uh, with that small group of slaves that had broken free from Crassus, uh, there is a pirate attack in the city of Ostia. So Ostia is the first port city uh, of ancient Rome. Uh, it's on the, the mouth of the Tiber River. Actually, that's what the word Ostia means. Um, and uh, so the Romans, it was, it was an ancient colony of the Romans. Uh, the, uh, Rome was always nicely placed, you know, uh, a little inland from the sea, so it was uh, relatively safer from pirates, where Ostia was the port city uh, that Rome used on the, on the mouth of the Tiber River. But this city, at this point, when after Pompey comes back, he gets attacked by these Cilician pirates. Pirates were a big problem in the Mediterranean at this time. And so Pompey gets this basically this this huge command, one of the biggest commands that was ever given to, uh, to a Roman, uh, of having control of all of the Roman military forces in the Mediterranean Sea and even on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea uh, for a certain several miles inland. And so he has this, you know, the, 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 this command over this vast Roman army and Pompey gets to work uh, defeating the pirates, you know, trying to put down the pirates. And so he takes basically fleets of Roman ships and he causes them to crisscross uh, the Mediterranean Sea in kind of a very organized way and attack any pirate ship they see, forcing the pirates back to their main headquarters. And then he attacks the main headquarters and finally destroys the pirates. And uh, those pirates that he takes captive, he actually relocates them on uh, a Roman farmland and uh, uh, allows them to, um, uh, you know, to become Roman citizens then and, 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 and to be productive citizens rather than, rather than pirates. But uh, in just, I believe it was like six months, Pompey was able to rid the entire Mediterranean Sea of pirates. So uh, he goes and defeats Sertorius. He comes back. He helps out with a couple of slaves that escaped from Crassus. And then he's given this huge command of the entire Mediterranean Sea. And in six short months, he rids the entire sea of pirates. Immediately after that, that old king Mithridates back in Asia Minor is causing problems again for the Romans. And so who do the Romans send uh, in command against Mithridates? They send Pompey. And so Pompey goes to fight against Mithridates, and he finally defeats him. So uh, he defeats Mithridates. Mithridates himself commits suicide, and uh, uh, Pompey has another feather to put in his cap. You know, he defeated that, that, that thorn in the Roman side, that King Mithridates who had killed all those Roman citizens, you know, years before. 
And Pompey doesn't just come back to Rome after that, though. He stays in the east, the Middle East. Uh, you know, uh, Mithridates was in Turkey. So he, he swings down south of Turkey into the Levant, uh, into the Middle East, basically, and uh, basically uh, forms a whole bunch of client kingdoms there. Uh, for himself, basically, for Rome. I mean, these client kingdoms are, are kings that then pay tribute to Rome and are subservient to Rome. But he also sees them as kind of uh, clients to himself personally. So Pompey sees himself as this great general, and these clients are going to be subservient to him personally. Uh, and he actually even swoops all the way down into Egypt and uh, um, uh, helps... Uh, helps the pharaoh, uh, Ptolemy the Twelfth. Uh, he helps him down in Egypt stay on the throne, and he even takes Ptolemy the Twelfth, the the pharaoh of Egypt, one of the last of the Alexandrian generals, uh, the the family of Alexandrian generals that had taken char- taken control of Egypt, one one of those last Alexandrian general families, uh, and makes them kind of a client king to himself, uh, and so by swooping through the Middle East there. And causing all of these kings to become client kings to Rome and pay tribute to Rome, he actually, I believe, doubles the amount of money coming into the Roman treasury. So, in just a few short years, Pompey has defeated the general Sertorius in Spain, come back and and uh, uh, finished off slaves that had, that had escaped from Crassus, defeated all the pirates in the Mediterranean Sea, defeated King Mithridates and established several other client kingdoms in the Middle East, doubling the amount of intake that the Roman treasury is taking. So when Pompey comes back to Rome after, after all of these victories, he truly is then, I guess, Pompey the Great. Um, all right, so that's what Pompey's been doing. Meanwhile, uh, back in Rome, uh, another politician which would become important is Marcus Tullius Cicero. Marcus Tullius Cicero is, is so important. Um, well, basically because he wanted to be important. We know more about Cicero than we know about most any other ancient figure, perhaps before Napoleon. And the reason we do is because Cicero wanted us to know so much about him. He, he left behind so much writing about himself and about the time period. It's from Cicero's writing that we have such a detailed account of what happens during this late Republican time period. Uh, so Cicero was kind of a vain character. You know, he, 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 he knew that he was a gifted orator and speaker and lawyer, uh, and he left behind lots of records to prove that he was. Um, but his future wasn't so certain when he was starting off. Uh, when he was starting off, he had no huge family connections with the rich aristocratic families. Um, and he really wasn't a gifted military commander. Like I said, one of the ways to work your way up the political ladder at Rome at this time was to be a, a gifted military commander, and Cicero certainly was not that. Uh, what he did have a gift in was in oratory and was in speaking as a lawyer in court. Um, one of his first cases was defending a guy named Sextus Rascius. Uh, supposedly Sextus Rascius' father had been prescribed, um, but Sextus Rascius' father was killed, and Sextus Rascius was... Uh, accused of the crime of killing his own father, which to the Romans was one of the most horrific crimes, well, probably the most horrific crime that you could commit. You think about, you know, people being accused of horrific crimes, even nowadays, and even if they're innocent, just the accusation of the crime, uh, you know, kind of gives them a a, a bad, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, is is a black mark. Uh, on on their uh, on their life, even if they were innocent, right? Just being accused of uh, a particularly heinous crime, and you think of people who are accused of particularly heinous crimes. A lot of times, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's easier to convict them because because people are so distracted by by the the heinousness of the crime that they automatically think, well, whoever the police must have arrested must have done that. So Sextus Rascius was in a similar situation. He was being accused of killing his father, which was one of the, the worst things that a Roman could do. And so it took a lot of guts for Cicero to defend Sextus Rascius. And it, it, was, a, it was actually a great uh, trial because what Cicero did, you know, Cicero was one of those lawyers who always felt that the best defense 
is a good offense. So rather than really defending his client, Sextus Raskius, uh, Cicero looked for at the accusers and, and actually uh, made the, the judges and the jury and the people uh, question whether the accusers themselves had some kind of uh, um, desire to put Sextus Raskius away. Uh, the phrase that Cicero used in the court case was qui bono, or who benefits. Uh, so he was showing how the people who were accusing Sextus Raskius had benefited from, from the outer Raskius' death, and therefore kind of uh, uh, basically insinuating that those accusers may have been the ones in charge of, or the ones responsible for the outer Sextus Raskius' death and not necessarily Sextus Raskius. So taking on this challenging case, you know, with a lot of guts, um, and winning the case, Cicero uh, basically overnight became a, a kind of a, a courtroom sensation. Uh, so then he, he worked his way up the political ladder, and uh, he became a quaestor in Spain, which is basically like a treasurer. It's one of the lower level offices uh, uh, in, in the political ladder. And, and again, uh, he served probably as quaestor back in Rome. And then after his year as quaestor in Rome, he had to serve out in the provinces. That was another thing that uh, was in the Roman constitution, that if you served a political office back in Rome, you, you had to then the next year serve out in the provinces. It, it ensured two things. It ensured that there were experienced people out in the provinces who were running things in the provinces who had experience back in Rome. And it also removed people from Rome itself so they wouldn't become too popular back in Rome so that people would forget about them uh, um, uh, so that no person could become too powerful. So following these kind of steps, you know, serving as quaestor in Rome and then serving in, in Sicily, uh, the people in Sicily uh, knew that Cicero was kind of this, this up-and-coming lawyer. And uh, they had a big problem with the governor of Sicily, the Roman governor of Sicily, a guy named Verres. Uh, and so they asked Cicero to prosecute Verres, to, uh, um, uh, to charge Verres with crimes of corruption as being governor. Uh, again, this is another very challenging case. You know, in a Roman courtroom, uh, uh, would... Cicero be able to prosecute uh, a Roman governor uh, for crimes against uh, you know people who were not Roman people who the Romans considered like basically uh, uh, one of the provincials. Uh, so to prosecute a Roman governor in a Roman courtroom, the 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 cards were kind of stacked against Cicero. Not only that, but one of the most gifted, well, the most gifted lawyer in Rome, Hortensius, was the one who was defending Verres. So Cicero was going up against the uh, um, uh, the most powerful or the, the most outspoken attorney in Rome, Hortensius. And so Cicero, though, shows to the court that Verres was so corrupt that if the court, he, he basically like uh, uh, frightened the court into finding on his side. If the court found in favor of Verres, it would show that they were being bribed and they were corrupt too. And remember, Cicero is making these arguments again amongst the common people. So he's using the common people again uh, uh, to kind of uh, say, look at the crimes of Verres. The crimes of Verres are so great that if you find Varys innocent, all the people here will know that you're just in it with Varys. You're, you're as corrupt as Varys. You're taking bribes from Varys. And so Cicero um, wins the case against Varys, even with the cards stacked against him, and defeats uh, the other attorney, Hortensius. So since Hortensius was the best lawyer in Rome before the case, now that Cicero defeated him, Cicero now becomes the best lawyer in Rome. And Cicero continues to rise up the political ladder. And, and, and despite all of Cicero's successes in life, his, the, the courtroom cases that he won, uh, the philosophical books that he would write later in his life, uh, Cicero would point to the one uh, thing that he was most proud of in his life was winning every um, election in his year. So... As you went up the step of political ladders, the cursus honorum, the course of honors, um, you would, you know, be elected first as quaestor, and then maybe as edio, and then maybe as praetor, and then eventually as consul. 
uh, for each of those spaces, there were less and less spaces. And so you were competing against the same people. Let's say 10 people were elected quaestor. Then only maybe six of those people could eventually become edils or things like that. Uh, so there were less spaces to be had. And uh, each of them had a, an age requirement as well. And so when Cicero says he won each election in his year, it was the first year he would have been eligible to run for that office. He won election to that office. And again, he didn't do it by uh, uh, having a vast amount of income himself or by having connections with powerful political families. He was, uh, you know, he just did it uh, based on, on his successes that he's had in the courtroom. And so he, he won election to every single one of his offices in his year including the consulship. So he eventually worked his way all the way up to the consulship. And so Cicero is one of those people we call a novus homo, a new man, uh, meaning that um, uh, he's the first person in his family to ever win the consulship. But once you've won the consulship, you gain what, the, what I was talking about before, nobles, nobility, not just for yourself, but for your whole family. So everybody in your family will now forever afterwards be known as part of the nobility, because somebody back in your family tree had won election to consulship. And so Cicero won election to consulship and served his year as consul. During his year as consul, it was actually pretty boring. But it was near the end of his year of consul that uh, there, there was kind of um, uh, basically uh, a great attempt to overthrow the Roman government. Uh, some of these patricians, these, these people that had lost election against Cicero, uh, gathered around in a conspiracy, a conspiracy led by one of Cicero's great political enemies, Catiline. And so Catiline began this conspiracy, uh, uh, rounding up disgruntled uh, 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 Roman politicians and uh, uh, planning to overthrow uh, Cicero's government, planning to assassinate Cicero, to kill him, and to install himself, Catiline, in power, and to uh, give rewards to the people who supported him. Um, Cicero, uh, because Cicero, uh, one of the things that Cicero successfully did was he had a, a network of agents, kind of like spies, uh, throughout the city looking for any kind of danger that was popping up. Cicero was able to intercept letters that was written between these conspirators and was able to expose the conspiracy of Catiline. And uh, uh, Cicero makes a famous speech uh, uh, against Catiline uh, to the Senate, convincing the Senate that Catiline is up to no good that he's uh, uh, conspiring against um, uh, the Roman government, that he's, that he's going to try to assassinate him, Cicero. Uh, and his oratory, his, his speech to the Senate is so good that people physically move away from Catiline um, as, uh, uh, as Cicero is making the speech, you know, uh, kind of representing Catiline's isolation. Um, so Catiline after those speeches, flees from Rome and joins up with the army that he's forming to overthrow the government in northern Italy. Uh, and uh, Cicero eventually sends an army against him and Catiline and his army is defeated. Uh, through the letters and through the agents, they round up uh, several other politicians back in Rome who were conspiring with Catiline. And a debate uh, rises up in the Senate about what to do with these conspirators. They're, they're Roman citizens, so should they get a trial before any kind of punishment? Uh, uh, as a Roman citizen, actually, especially as a wealthy Roman citizen, you always had, and this is one thing the Varies did, uh, you always had the option of going into exile. So even if you were facing a trial, which could mean your execution, uh, instead of facing the trial, if you knew you were guilty, you could forfeit your property, and go into exile. Uh, but what the Romans feared is if they gave these politicians a trial, they would go into exile and then join up with Catiline and, and increase his, his strength in northern Italy. Uh, and so they would go and, and you'd have to fight them again. So Cicero and Cato the Younger, who was another politician in the Senate at the time, argued for the immediate death of these conspirators, that it was proven that these conspirators had committed a crime, was conspiring against the government, and uh, they argued for the immediate death. 
Julius Caesar is actually back in Rome at this time. He's sitting in the Roman Senate. He's another one working his way up the political ladder. And uh, uh, Julius Caesar actually argues a novel idea that the, that the conspirators um, should be imprisoned in different Roman cities uh, to await trial, but they shouldn't uh, execute Roman citizens uh, without a trial. Um, however, uh, Cato and Cicero win the day in their argument, and uh, um, the conspirators are put to death uh, by strangulation. Uh, when um, Cicero announces their death, he simply says, Wixit, or Wixerunt, meaning they have lived. Uh, again, not wanting to say that they were executed because, uh, again, the taboo against executing Roman citizens without a trial. But, uh, um, uh, so he simply said, Wixerunt, means they lived, meaning they're no longer living. Uh, eventually, again, like I said, Cicero sends an army against Catiline, and Catiline and his army is defeated. Uh, this is the high point of Cicero's career. He's called the Pater Patriae, the father of the country, because he saved the government uh, from, this, uh, from this conspiracy to overthrow it. However, Cicero would later perhaps come to regret uh, you know, having executed those Roman citizens without a trial. Uh, a later political enemy, a guy named Clodius Pocare, uh, will uh, himself give up his patrician status and be elected as tribune, and Clodius really does not like Cicero. So one of the things that Clodius does is he makes an ex post facto law saying that anybody who killed a Roman citizen without a trial uh, must themselves be punished. And, and this kind of forces Cicero into exile later on. And this is one of the saddest moments of Cicero's life when he's forced into exile, when he's forced to leave the city of Rome itself uh, because of this ex post facto law from one of his political enemies. And, and Clodius actually then goes to Cicero's house and burns Cicero's house down. Clodius is kind of a rabble rouser, and uh, we'll talk about him a little more uh, in a moment. Uh, here is a, a painting of Cicero delivering his speech against Catiline. You can see Catiline on the right-hand side there as uh, Cicero's oratory um, forces people to distance themselves from Catiline. And you see Catiline kind of uh, both uh, literally and metaphorically isolated from the rest of the people. Uh, the interesting thing about this painting is it makes Cicero looks like an older man in the in the painting, when really Cicero was younger than Catiline uh, when he delivered these speeches. And uh, I, I've, I've talked a little bit about Julius Caesar here and there he's, as he's kind of come into the narrative, but I want to step back and, and talk about what Julius Caesar was doing this entire time uh, when Sulla was dictator and afterwards. Julius Caesar obviously is a central figure uh, in the Roman Revolution. If you've noticed, the painting that I use as the background screen uh, uh, shows one of the, the climactic points of, of the Roman Revolution, the assassination of this particular figure. Uh, so let us go back and talk about Julius Caesar himself. All right, so Julius Caesar came from an ancient patrician family, the Julii family. The Julii family traced their family tree supposedly all the way back to Aeneas and Venus, the goddess of Venus, and therefore Jupiter himself. Uh, so Aeneas was, remember, the mythological character that escaped uh, from Troy, uh, led a group of Trojans through the Mediterranean, and supposedly ended up in Italy, where he established a new group of people, who would eventually become the Romans. So uh, many of the patrician families, you know, trace their family tree back to some god, a goddess, or mythical hero, or, or other. The Julii family happened to trace their family tree uh, back to Aeneas. Uh, uh, you know, we'll talk about Mark Antony later. Mark Antony uh, traced his own family tree uh, back to Hercules, supposedly. Um, so Julius Caesar uh, said, you know, his family is one of these ancient patrician families. Um, Julius Caesar's aunt uh, was the one who married Gaius Marius. So uh, Gaius Marius was Julius Caesar's uncle. And Julius Caesar was squarely in the Marian supporters when Sulla came and, and uh, uh, made himself a dictator of Rome. Caesar was even married to Cinna's daughter, Cornelia. Remember Cinna? Uh, was, uh, again, one of those big Marian supporters, and Cinna was the one left in charge of the city of Rome when Gaius Marius died of old age. And so uh, uh, Julius Caesar, like I said, was squarely in um, 
the Marian camp. When um, Sulla made himself dictator, uh, like I said, Julius Caesar's family, many of whom held important religious positions, uh, basically um, went up to Sulla and tried to protect Caesar from any kind of reprisals or from winding up on a prescription list. Sulla supposedly said that if Caesar divorced his wife Cornelia, because Cornelia was the daughter of, of another of Sulla's enemies, Cinna, um, if Caesar divorced Cornelia, he could live. Caesar, being very young at the time, but showing some of the boldness that would characterize him later in his life, um, refused. He said, I won't do what you tell me to. I'm not going to divorce my wife. And so Sulla uh, basically um, had enough with Caesar and was basically going to kill him. Caesar luckily uh, slept, skipped out of the city, slipped out of the city um, before, uh, before Sulla was able to get his hands on him. And Sulla kind of just let him escape. Uh, but supposedly Sulla said that, I know I'm going to regret that decision, for in that man I see many a Marius. All right, uh, so he sees like, you know, his old political enemy in Julius Caesar. So Julius Caesar escapes and, and he serves uh, uh, different Roman governors for a while. Uh, uh, he actually serves uh, in Bithynia uh, with a king named Nicomedes. Uh, while Caesar's in Bithynia, the story goes that he got too close to, uh, to Nicomedes. Uh, the reason I'm telling this story is for two reasons. Uh, first of all, it will uh, be a criticism that Caesar has to face down again and again uh, uh, later on in his political career, that his political enemies will say that Caesar, you know, Caesar conquered Gaul, but Nicomedes conquered Caesar, or they'll call him the Queen of Bithynia, or things like that, to make fun of Caesar. Uh, that Caesar had kind of uh, um, put himself uh, in, in kind of the junior row to Nicomedes. Uh, but the other reason also is you'll see that Caesar uses basically his sexuality. Uh, to get under the skin of his political enemies uh, or to um, uh, to basically gain influence or power any way that he can. Uh, supposedly it was said that Julius Caesar purposefully started affairs uh, with close relatives of his political enemies uh, so as to get under their skin. Uh, so uh, during, the, um, during the Catalinarian Conspiracy, uh, when Caesar was arguing that the conspirators should not be killed and should be instead detained, supposedly a secret message was sent to Caesar uh, in the Senate House. And Cato the Younger, uh, a political enemy of Julius Caesar's, uh, wanted Julius Caesar to read the note out loud because he thought that, um, that it would implicate Caesar as being one of the conspirators as well. Uh, and it ended up being a love letter uh, from Servilia. Servilia was a, a niece of Cato, uh, um, uh, from Servilia to Julius Caesar. So you can see how he uses like his relationships with other people in order to uh, get under the skin of his political enemies or to gain any kind of influence he can. Cicero, uh, besides working for King Nicomedes in Bithynia, also uh, studied oratory at this time in Greece. He studied under the same uh, uh, teachers who taught Cicero oratory. Um, uh, while he was staying away from Rome. And it was also during this time that supposedly he was captured by Cilician pirates. So this is, must be before Pompey rid the seas of Cilician pirates. But he was captured by Cilician pirates and held hostage. Uh, this occurred a lot in the Mediterranean Sea before Pompey's uh, great victory against them, where uh, the pirates would kidnap uh, wealthy Romans and hold them for ransom uh, uh, as a way to just kind of get money. Uh, so uh, oftentimes they didn't really harm the person who was kidnapped, but they were held detained uh, against their will, and then they would wait for their, their wealthy families back in Rome to pay a ransom for them. Uh, supposedly, when Caesar was being detained by these pirates, he would joke with them a lot. He would like yell at them for being too loud when he was trying to sleep. Uh, he would play games with them. Uh, it was almost like he was one of them. Uh, and uh, when they told him how much money they were asking for his ransom, he actually laughed at that and said that they should double it. 
uh, and and then from time to time he would suddenly stop and say, you know, when I'm out of here, I'm going to crucify all you guys. And, uh, um, and they all laughed at that, thinking that it was some kind of joke. But it wasn't. Uh, Caesar, as soon as his ransom was paid and he was released by the pirates, went to the nearest port city, uh, gathered up a fleet of ships, which again was totally illegal, but was one of these things that influential Romans did. They were just able to uh, uh, gather up armies here and there. Um, so gathered up a fleet of ships, went back to the headquarters of the pirates and crucified all those pirates. Um, so again, it kind of shows Julius Caesar's, um, uh, you know, uh, a, a boldness and also his, uh, uh, his directness, I guess you would say. Um, once uh, Sulla died, Julius Caesar came back to Rome and started to work his way up the Cursus Norm. Unfortunately for Julius Caesar, even though he was from one of these ancient patrician families, his family was not wealthy. They had fallen on kind of harder economic times. This is one of the reasons why his aunt had married Gaius Marius, because Gaius Marius was, was not a patrician, but seemed to be one of these up-and-coming politicians. So the Julii family wanted to connect themselves uh, with one of these up-and-coming politicians so that, um, uh, so that they could gain the prestige and wealth of that. Uh, and at the same time, uh, Gaius Marius married into the Julii family because they were one of these ancient patrician families. And again, it was an example of him using those optimates tactics. Um, so Julius Caesar's family, though, wasn't very well off economically. Supposedly, Julius Caesar himself was raised in an insulae or an apartment building. Uh, some people say that Julius Caesar's uh, um, kind of influence over his soldiers kind of stems from his understanding of middle class and working class people because those are the people he grew up around. So Julius Caesar doesn't have much money, but he comes back to Rome once Sulla's dead, and he starts to work his way up the political ladder. However, it takes a lot of money to work your way up the political ladder. First of all, none of the political offices themselves are paid. You don't get paid for being in the political office. It's, it's just your duty to do it. Um, and secondly, uh, there's a lot of bribery that's going on and a, and a lot of games that have to be thrown, like gladiatorial games and, and chariot racing and stuff like that, all these things that have to be done in order to make yourself popular to, uh, to win enough votes to win election. And so the uh, um, elections were becoming more and more expensive. And, and people would lend money to people who didn't have enough money to, uh, uh, to work their way up the political ladder and then would expect favors from those people when they rose high enough in the political ladder. And so Julius Caesar struck up a friendship, uh, interestingly enough, with Crassus. You know, Crassus was one of those old Southern supporters who had made himself super rich. And I guess Crassus saw in Julius Caesar, even though Julius Caesar was kind of a Marian, uh, he saw in Julius Caesar somebody who uh, had the, the, the gifts and the talents uh, to rise up uh, the political ladder and, and wanted to tie himself with that. So Julius Caesar and Crassus struck up a friendship, and Crassus is the one who funded much of Julius Caesar's rise up the political ladder. Uh, it was during this time that his aunt Julia actually died. Remember, any girl in the Julius uh, in the Julian family would be named Julia. So uh, Caesar's aunt Julia died, and uh, Julius Caesar delivered a funeral oration for her. And while he was doing that, he also mentioned the good things that his uncle Gaius Marius had done. So it was the first time that somebody dared to speak Gaius Marius's name publicly in a good way. Because again, that's one of those things that would end, get you on a prescription list very quickly when Sulla was still alive. Uh, and people began to remember you know, that Gaius Marius was very popular. He had defeated Jugurtha. He had defeated the Germans. You know, uh, they started to remember the, the good things that Gaius Marius had done. And, uh, and Julius Caesar kind of benefited from that, from being related to, to Gaius Marius. All right. Um, so this brings us to Julius Caesar orchestrating his rise to the consulship. It's, this is sometimes referred to as the first triumvirate, but it wasn't a triumvirate. Like, they didn't call it a triumvirate. The second triumvirate was actually officially a triumvirate. We'll talk about that later. Um, this happened to be three men who joined forces, uh, uh, formed a political alliance. And, uh, uh, but it didn't have to be three. It could have possibly been four. And at the beginning, it was a secret alliance. You know, nobody knew 
that these people were working together until Julius Caesar won the consulship and it was exposed uh, who the people behind him were. Um, you know, it, it might not have been three people. It actually, they invited Cicero to join into this group as well. It could have been four people. I don't know if we would have called it a, a quatrumvirate or something then. But, uh, but Cicero kind of uh, said that he wanted nothing to do with them. Uh, but Caesar... Uh, obviously was friends already with Marcus Crassus. So Marcus Crassus was the one who was kind of bankrolling Caesar's um, uh, rise in the political ladder. And remember, Marcus Crassus and pa uh, Gnaeus Pompey, Pompey the Great, uh, didn't like each other. Remember, Crassus always thought that Pompey always got the great military victories but did vi very little work for them. Um, so it kind of shows you the, the talent that Julius Caesar had, that he was able to get those two people that really didn't like each other, Crassus and Pompey, uh, together to work together in the same room. So Caesar, Pompey, and Crassus is going to form this alliance. And what the Romans called it is an amicitia, or it's the, it comes from the word meaning friendship. Uh, so an amicitia is a political alliance amongst equals. So they form this political alliance because they each want to get something out of it. Um, Pompey has won all these great military victories, but he has this huge army, and the, the Senate has been slow to grant retirement benefits and land uh, for, uh, so, for uh, Pompey's retiring soldiers. Uh, Crassus, again, always wants to gain more money, so he has some different laws that wants to be passed uh, for his own business interests. And um, uh, Caesar just wants to become consul. So even though we call this an amicitia, an alliance between equals, Caesar clearly is the uh, the junior partner uh, in this in this partnership of of these three men. Um, but uh, Caesar, uh, everybody basically gets what they want uh, through the backing of Pompey and Crassus. Caesar wins election uh, to the consulship. He solidifies his alliance by, well, he actually does divorce his wife Cornelia here and marries a woman named Calpurnia. Um, and uh, uh, Pompey also marries Julia. Julia is Caesar's daughter. So Pompey, remember, is older than Julius Caesar. So Julius Caesar forces his own daughter to marry Gnaeus Pompey uh, to form, to solidify this political alliance between him and Pompey. Um, and um, uh, but even though Pompey was so much older than Julia, uh, by all accounts, uh, the marriage between Pompey and Julia was a loving one. Uh, you know, people, the other politicians would actually make fun of Pompey for this. They would say, you know, hey, get a little Pompey. He actually loves his wife. Because most of the politicians at that time were in these arranged marriages that were formed for political alliances, like this one. Uh, but they had no real emotional connection with their spouses. Um, but Pompey did. Uh, so the records show that Pompey and Julia did have a loving relationship. Uh, but the reason that Pompey married Julia was to solidify that marriage between himself and Caesar. And so in 59 BC, uh, Caesar was elected consul and uh, 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 Pompey finally got some land for his veterans and Crassus got some bills passed that made him even richer. Um, in that year, 59 BC, uh, Caesar had a co-consul named Bibulus, uh, who was really a rival of Caesar's. He hated Caesar. And Caesar had all these laws that he had to pass, you know, getting land for Pompey's veterans, passing those laws that Crassus wanted passed. And so uh, um, Caesar, when he was consul, um, basically did everything his way and forced Bibulus to basically go into hiding in his own house. And so people sometimes refer to the year of 59 BC because all of the years in, in uh, you know, obviously they didn't use the, the word BC or AD. Uh, there was a term AUC, Aberbe Condita, which means from the founding of the city. But really how the Romans referred to their years was the two consuls who were consul that year. Remember, uh, uh, with the exception of Gaius Marius, you know, two new consuls would be elected every single year. Uh, and if those consuls, so each year would be named after those two consuls. So uh, it should have been the year of Caesar and Bibulus. That's what a 59 BC should have been known as. But people called it the year of Julius and Caesar because it was so clear that Bibulus really was doing nothing as consul but hiding out in his house. Um, so during the end of Caesar's consulship, once he'd succeeded in, in passing all the laws that he wanted to, to pass, 
um, he wanted a military victory for himself. Now, Caesar is over 40 years old right now. And even though we know Julius Caesar today is a, a great military leader and a great general, up until this point, Caesar has no huge military victories. He, he served as praetor in Spain for a little bit, but other than that, he has no huge military victories to his name. Uh, supposedly, Julius Caesar, when he had visited the tomb of Alexander the Great, supposedly wept because Alexander had accomplished so much more in such a brief amount of time, and Caesar hadn't really accomplished anything up until that point. And so uh, uh, Caesar is not, at this point, even in his 40s, the great military leader that we know him as today. He has no real military glory to his name, and that was one of these things that these young men were always, um, always competing for. And so Caesar wanted a great military victory. So he looked around the map and he, he thought about, you know, where he could attack to gain some military glory. And uh, one of the places was northern Italy, uh, way up north in Italy. Uh, there was the whole country of France that was not under Roman control. And, uh, you know, different parts of Switzerland and, and, and uh, the area up near the Balkans and, and things like that. And so Caesar was thinking that if he were governor of Cisalpine Gaul, basically northern Italy, uh, he would have a starting point uh, from which to launch a military campaign to win him some military glory. Plus, he owed a lot of people a lot of money. So um, uh, a lot of times, uh, one of the things, like I said, uh, uh, people who served in, in magistracies back in Rome, the next year had to serve out in the provinces. And one of the things that these these politicians would do out in the provinces was, again, try to gouge it of money to pay back their creditors uh, who, um, uh, who they were indebted to after working their way up the political ladder. Uh, so Caesar needed a great military victory, both, both because he wanted military glory and he wanted some money as well. And so uh, he engineered it so that he would become uh, governor of not just Cisalpine Gaul, but the tribunes actually made him, and the people made him, governor of Transalpine Gaul as well, uh, the small area which we now know as Provence, uh, because it was a Roman province. It was the way the Romans got from Italy to Spain, even though they hadn't yet controlled much of what is today modern-day France. So Gaul, Gallia, is the Latin word for uh, modern-day France. So Caesar gets this governorship, what was called a proconsulship, so he has the power of a consul, um, but without being elected to it, uh, of, of Cisalpine Gaul and Transalpine Gaul. And it becomes a, a launching point uh, for his war, eventually what we'll call the, the wars in Gaul. Um, at this time, Pompey reinstates Cicero. Remember, Cicero had been exiled uh, because Clodius uh, uh, had made that ex post facto law against him. Um, and uh, Caesar goes up to Gaul, uh, to basically um, become governor there and begin a war there, which we'll talk about soon. And after five years of, of this, of Caesar being governor in Gaul, so he, he's appointed governor, he's there for five years. And after that fifth year, uh, Marcus Crassus himself is looking for some military glory himself. Uh, Marcus Crassus, uh, has all, that military glory has always seemed to elude him. You know, he, uh, he won that battle at the Colline Gates when he was with Sulla, but that was in a civil war against fellow Romans. So he never really got a lot of glory for that. You know, the, the, the most glory that a Roman could get was against a foreign enemy, like Mithridates or Jugurtha or the Gauls. Um, another thing, uh, Crassus defeated Spartacus, but Spartacus was seen as just kind of a slave, even though Spartacus was hugely successful and the Romans couldn't get a handle on him with three whole armies before Crassus, uh, people saw that as, well, he just defeated a slave army. And plus, he needed to share that glory with Pompey. So Crassus was still himself, even though Crassus was becoming an old man at this time, uh, was still himself looking for some military glory. So after five years of Caesar being in Gaul and winning this military glory for himself, Crassus wanted to win some military glory for himself. So Crassus uh, put himself in charge of an army out in Parthia, which was uh, in the Middle East, you know, the old Persian Empire. The Parthians were the ones in control of it now. And uh, um, uh, Crassus went to go fight the Parthians. 
Unfortunately for Crassus, he was led astray by a guide that betrayed his army out in the desert, and then he was ambushed and attacked by the Parthians, uh, who continuously shot arrows at his army. Uh, Crassus watched uh, his own son die on the battlefield near the beginning of the battle, uh, and and after watching his own son die, kind of kind of became non-responsive, and really wasn't in command of the army, and uh, the Roman army continued to be hit by these arrows, and uh, uh, what ended up, uh, but the. Parthians thought was probably just going to be a skirmish or a quick ambush, ended up uh, destroying much of Crassus's army, and Crassus himself was forced to um, to talk to parley with uh, with the Parthians. Uh, supposedly, when he went to go talk with the Parthians, uh, they seized him and killed Crassus himself. And uh, supposedly, they poured molten gold down Crassus's throat because um, they were they well knew that Crassus was. Uh, famous for being the wealthiest man in Rome. Uh, so Crassus uh, meets kind of a grim fate there in Parthia, uh, still searching for that military glory uh, that would have been his. Uh, when the news came back home, I mean, obviously the Romans uh, uh, were shocked that a Roman army had been defeated. Uh, but, you know, they didn't care so much that the elder Crassus had died, but the younger Crassus, uh, uh, who died in the battle at the beginning of the battle, um, was seen as kind of an up-and-comer and may have played a huge role in, in, in the years to come. And so his death was seen as a huge tragedy uh, back in Rome, the, the younger Crassus. As I was just alluding, Caesar so far has had a pretty successful political career. But as for a military career, he really hasn't had much of one yet. And yet today, we know him as this great general and this great military leader. And this is where he really begins uh, his military career uh, in Gaul. Uh, he engineered it for himself to have a, um, uh, a governorship, both of Cisalpine Gaul, which means Gaul on the near side of the Alps, otherwise northern Italy, as well as governorship of Transalpine Gaul, or Gaul on the far side of the Alps, across the Alps, uh, what is today modern-day Provence. And he used this as a base of operations to launch a military campaign into Gallia, or Gaul, or um, what today is modern-day France. Um, he may have actually been thinking about launching military campaigns in the other direction, towards Austria, um, but uh, when the opportunity presented itself uh, by the, the Swiss, the Helvetians, uh, basically uh, migrating from their uh, home territory across Gaul, he used that as basically um, an opportunity to enter Gaul uh, by being invited by the, the tribes that were um, being harassed by the Helvetians as they migrated through their territory. Um, and so he made it look like he was just being asked, invited into Gaul to help, uh, you know, allied tribes of Rome in Gaul. Uh, Gaul also kind of loomed large in the Roman imagination uh, for psychological reasons as well. You have to remember that it was uh, Gallic tribes under a chieftain named Brennus, who way back in 390 BC had entered Italy and had sacked Rome in 390 BC. So the Romans always had this kind of fear of the Gauls that, that came about again during the Catalinarian conspiracy when uh, one of the uh, things that Cicero claimed about Catiline was that he was conspiring with Gauls uh, in order to amass an army to overthrow the Roman government. So there was this uh, kind of age-old fear of the Gauls that Caesar wished to exercise from the Roman psyche. Uh, so that also kind of um, perhaps was another reason why Caesar decided to enter Gaul and um, uh, focus his military operations there. Um, he, one of the reasons why we know so much about the Gallic Wars is because, again, uh, the, the, the main mover here wanted us to know so much about it. Uh, Caesar left behind a, a series of books called the Commentaries on the Gallic War, and uh, uh, they have been kind of a cornerstone of, of learning Latin uh, for ages. Um, 
and they're currently part of the AP syllabus right now. Uh, so one of the reasons why Caesar wrote uh, the commentaries on the Gallic War was to get around uh, that idea of losing popularity and losing political influence back in Rome by being physically removed from Rome. So it was one of the things that was kind of engineered into the, the Republic that magistrates, after they'd served their time in Rome, uh, would then serve as governors or would serve in provinces uh, far away from Rome. Uh, and part of the idea was to have experienced people go out to these provinces and uh, uh, administrate them. But a bigger part was really to remove uh, popular politicians from Rome for a time uh, and make them serve out in the provinces so that they could, were removed from their base of support and uh, uh, so that they... Uh, could lose some of their political influence back in Rome and so that no one person could become too powerful again. Uh, so Caesar basically was circumventing this by uh, sending home, uh, and again, this is debated, but but I believe that he sent home on a yearly basis basically these reports from Gaul of all of these things that he was doing in Gaul. So in a way, the commentaries on the Gallic War serve as kind of a piece of propaganda, a piece of political messaging uh, that Caesar was trying to keep his name uh, kind of uh, well, well known and popular back in Rome. And, and the people back in Rome would celebrate holidays when uh, his legions won great victories or or be in mourning when, when he suffered setbacks and uh, uh, would be hoping for Caesar's, uh, you know, well-being as he led several Roman legions uh, up there in Gaul. So uh, the yearly um, books of the commentaries on the Gallic War, which were sent to Rome, again, were kind of meant to be a reminder to the Romans of what was happening in Gaul and a reminder to the Romans of who Caesar was and to keep him popular back in Rome. So in a way, those commentaries were, were like a piece of propaganda or political messaging. Um, yet, you know, we, we learn a great deal uh, from, the, um, from the commentaries themselves uh, just as they are. I mean, Caesar cannot straight out lie in the commentaries. There are too many people serving with him, too many officers, some of the officers who would one day, you know, kind of go against him, who would call him out on the straight out lie. Uh, we do see kind of errors of omission or, or what Caesar chooses to emphasize. So it's an interesting study at looking at political messaging and, uh, um, you know, uh, how Caesar tries to uh, depict things uh, uh, that happened back in uh you know to the for the people back in Rome. Uh it also gives us an insight into um you know Roman uh basically the Roman military, uh Roman military practices and diplomatic policy. Uh and Caesar's viewpoint, his vision for what correct Roman diplomatic policy should be. Um and finally it is a true primary source. It is a uh, 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 written by somebody who was actually there. And uh, it's not just the diary of a foot soldier or something, but it's the general who's in charge who has kind of a more of a larger view of the uh, the war and somebody who's also a gifted writer, remember, who learned under the same teachers who taught Cicero. So for all those reasons, uh, the commentaries on the Gallic War uh, is an important piece of literature to study today. And as I was saying about, you know, how it exposes ideas of Caesar's view of, of foreign policy, uh, the, the beginning of the Gallic Wars famously begins, Gallia est omnis divisa in partes tres, which means omnis Gallia, all of Gaul, divisa est, has been divided in tres partes, into three parts. It's kind of a dry beginning to the Gallic Wars, but Caesar is trying to establish kind of a setting uh, for his Roman readers. So it, it would be hard for him to copy a map for everybody back in Rome, but he uses words to kind of create a geographical map of, of view in people's minds, the same way that when somebody opens up the Lord of the Rings, one of the first things they see is a map uh, of this kind of foreign land and, and, and how that piques their interest. Um, secondly, uh, this whole idea of dividing Gaul, you know, that Gaul is divided, um, First of all, kind of portrays Gaul as some place that's ripe for conquering. 
um, you know, perhaps misleadingly so. Uh, but secondly, I kind of give this insight into one of Caesar's most famous quotes, Diwi de et impera, divide and conquer. The idea that as long as you keep people separated from each other, it's more easily to con conquer the entire area, to conquer everybody. Uh, and Caesar does this through uh, basically the kind of the carrot and the stick, uh, offering certain tribes certain benefits, uh, um, uh, giving, you know, uh, basically certain benefits to tribes so that they would ally themselves with Caesar and join with Caesar. And so by keeping some tribes on his side and uh, kind of playing the internal politics of those tribes and playing tribes off against each other, he's able to keep the different tribes of God divided against each other and in that way is more easily able to kind of control uh, the entire country. Uh, so uh, he kind of got involved in all these intra-Gallic conflicts and by that way tried to keep the tribes divided against each other. Uh, in, during his time in Gaul, which uh, spanned some, you know, seven years, uh, he also crossed twice over the Rhine River into Germany and he crossed twice over the English Channel into Britain. Uh, when he did these things, he said, you know, ostensibly he was doing them to show the, the neighboring, you know, tribes up in Britain and the Germans that they couldn't come into Gaul and interfere in Gallic business and then run across the, the English Channel or the Rhine River again and think that they were safe from Roman reprisals. Uh, he wanted to show that the Romans could go anywhere, that they would follow them into Germany or go up into Britain. Uh, but also... Uh, this also had kind of a psychological effect back uh, for the Romans back in Rome. You know, the, if the Gauls were kind of these feared tribes that lived to the north of Italy, the Germans, who had just invaded Italy during the time of Gaius Marius, uh, was doubly so, kind of these feared tribes. So here is Caesar crossing over into Germany itself and uh, taking on those German tribes, you know, firsthand. Uh, and Britain to the Romans. Britain almost seemed like this mythical island. Like some of the the Romans didn't even know that Britain was even there, or or or, or thought that it might not even be there. Uh, it was basically like the end of the world. Uh, so Caesar crossing the English Channel was like Caesar basically going to Mars. You know, uh, uh, he was doing something that 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 was you know oh, just right on the 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 outskirts of the Roman imagination there. Uh, to cross over into this mythical territory and, and fight uh, uh, these tribes up in Britain. Um, so not only did, was there the ostensible reason of trying to um, stop the Germans and the Brits from interfering in his conquest of Gaul, uh, but there was also that psychological effect that crossing the Rhine River and crossing the English Channel had on the people back in Rome, uh, where they were simply awed by Caesar's daring and his accomplishments and success in these far-flung areas. Um, so, as I said, Caesar was pretty successful in keeping the Gallic tribes divided against each other, and in that way, one by one, uh, kind of conquering different parts of Gaul. Uh, and modern-day France. It's a big country. And when Caesar said Gaul, he, he meant more than just Gaul. He meant modern-day France, modern-day, uh, you know, Switzerland, uh, modern-day Belgium, you know, so it was this vast territory. So he kept the tribes pretty much divided against each other and was able to conquer them one by one. Uh, and he installed his own chieftains in different tribes uh, uh, who were loyal to him. Um, but this all kind of came crashing down in the seventh year uh, when a charismatic leader, Vercingetorix, uh, basically seemed like he had the ability. I mean, he had been one of these, uh, um, uh, basically one of these these leaders that had served under Caesar for a while. Uh, he seemed that he uh, had the answer to to fighting the Romans and. Uh, uh, many of the tribes of God that had been divided against each other the past, the past six years had rallied uh, to Vercingetorix. And Vercingetorix seemed like he was uniting the entire country uh, against Julius Caesar. Uh, even Julius Caesar's closest allies during the, the, the years of campaigning in Gaul uh, 
uh, the Idui tribe, uh, the one that supposedly first caught him in to help with the Helvetians, uh, a guy named Comius, who Caesar had trusted to cross over to Britain to kind of scout out Britain. Um, those staunchest allies even kind of went against Caesar uh, uh, during this final uh, insurrection of, of Vercingetorix. Uh, Vercingetorix almost brought Caesar to his knees because Caesar did not have a supply train going back to Roman territory. When Caesar was marching around Gaul, conquering the, the territory, he relied on the local grain. He relied on basically taking grain from the farms in Gaul to feed his army. And uh, uh, so Vercingetorix uh, initiated uh, what today we call a scorched earth policy. Uh, he burned down all of his own grain and all of these villages that could not be defended. And uh, he only kept the most defensible cities uh, intact. And so in that way, uh, yes, he, he, he did starve many of his own Gallic citizens, but he hurt the Romans even more because the Romans were relying on that grain to feed their army. And so he burned down basically all the grain, all these small villages, uh, even some larger towns, all to deprive Caesar of grain, all to starve the Romans out. And that almost brought Caesar's army uh, to their knees. Uh, but in some daring actions, uh, Caesar ended up winning a cavalry battle against Vercingetorix that was unexpected. And then, rather than um, heading back to Provence for the winter, uh, Caesar pursued Vercingetorix to the city called Alesia. And uh, the final stand between Vercingetorix and Caesar uh, was fought out at Alesia. And uh, Vercingetorix was basically barricaded in the city itself, and Caesar ended up building a double envelopment around the city. So he built one wall around the entire city uh, to trap Vercingetorix and his men inside the city and starve them out. And then he built another wall facing outwards because Vercingetorix had sent his cavalry out to go get help, to go get a relief army to come, come help him at, uh, at Alesia. And so he, Caesar built, uh, expecting this relief army to come at any point, he built another wall facing outward to stop anybody from the outside coming to Vercingetorix's assistance. And so Caesar ended up fighting basically this two-front battle uh, facing Vercingetorix in the city on one side and then facing outward against actually Comius, who led a relief army to come try to help Vercingetorix. And uh, um, again, uh, Caesar almost lost his battle. He was basically uh, uh, putting all of his eggs in this one basket of, of winning this one battle. Uh, but uh, Caesar pulled through. Uh, he sent uh, reinforcements to areas where he saw um, uh, was, was needing it. Um, Mark Antony uh, actually as a lieutenant comes uh, and plays a, a pretty big role in this battle and then Caesar himself uh, wearing his red general's cloak even though that made him more of a target went out and fought with his men so that the, the men could see that he was putting himself in as much danger as they were and uh, uh, through all of these actions he was able to win the day at Alesia and uh, after defeating Vercingetorix at Alesia uh, Vercingetorix surrendered to Caesar. That's the painting that you see on the side right there. And uh, um, and that basically broke the back of Gallic resistance against Roman conquest. So uh, all of the, the last people who wanted to fight against the Romans joined up with Vercingetorix. And once they were defeated, uh, there was nobody really left who, who really resisted. Uh, Roman conquest. So in this, this series of years, and, and there was an eighth year uh, uh, where Caesar has left the scene, but uh, one of his lieutenants kind of uh, uh, takes up mopping operations. Um, so during these eight years of conquest, the Romans were able to basically annex uh, uh, all of modern-day France and Belgium into the Roman Empire, uh, making Caesar a, a kind of become that, that popular uh, general who's won this great military glory uh, that he had been seeking through much of his professional life. So Caesar now loomed just as large 
uh, if not larger, uh, than Pompey the Great. You know, Pompey the Great in his day had been hugely successful as well, but by this time that had been years ago, and now Caesar was the rising star, much in the same way as kind of Solo was the rising star when, when as Marius was getting older. Um, so as Caesar um, was fighting in Gaul, uh, several things happened. First of all, the first triumvirate that that uh, alliance between uh, Pompey, Crassus, and Caesar fell apart, first of all, because Crassus died, remember, in Parthia. Uh, also, Julia, Caesar's daughter, died in childbirth, and that kind of severed the connection between him and Pompey. And Caesar has been up in Gaul this entire time, winning military glory for himself, while Pompey has been back in Rome. Uh, and uh, uh, in a way, Pompey may have been becoming jealous over Caesar's military glory, uh, uh, you know, uh, rising as, as, as Pompey's military glory seemed to have been, you know, kind of long ago. But also, Pompey back in Rome uh, fell victim to the optimates, the, the, the senators, uh, people like Cato the Younger, who hated Caesar and uh, uh, who saw Caesar as a huge threat um, to, uh, um, you know, to the, the Republic. Um, you know, they were still angry over uh, Caesar's consulship in 59 BC and how badly he handled, you know, Bibulus, uh, how he forced Bibulus to basically go into hiding over the entire year, um, how Caesar had kind of pushed through uh, all of his, the bills that he wanted. Uh, and they... They also were, were concerned about Caesar, you know, using bribery in his elections. Now, most of these politicians used bribery in their elections, but Caesar didn't seem to be too discreet about it. He was very wide open about using bribery in his, uh, his elections, and, and they felt that threatened, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the, the, the government and, and their, their place in the government. And so you had a lot of senators who were very angry at Caesar, uh, and were looking to prosecute him for crimes. And uh, while Pompey was back in Rome, uh, these politicians kind of were whispering in Pompey's ear and trying to get Pompey to go against Caesar, which they uh, eventually successfully did. Um, and so uh, Caesar um, understood that he had a lot of political enemies back in Rome and that they were lining up to charge him for crimes uh, when he lost his position as governor. So as long as he was consul or as long as he was governor up in Gaul, uh, he was immune from any kind of prosecution. But as soon as his term ended and his, and, uh, his, his term was coming to an end, um, he was then open to prosecution. And if he was convicted of, of these crimes like bribery, um, you know, of his... Uh, of, handling uh, of the consulship and of his war in Gaul, which really didn't have any senatorial support uh, uh, throughout the, the, the war, um, if he was found guilty of a crime, that could be the end of his political career. It could even force him into exile. And so he'd been working his entire life to, to rise up this political ladder and now, he, like the Gracchi brothers, he had come to this kind of dead end. Um, and so Caesar decided to take a page out of Sulla's handbook and take his army and march on Rome. I mean, he did this as, as kind of a last resort. He, he did send um, Mark Antony down to Rome to try to represent him, to try to convince the Senate that uh, Caesar maybe could run for the next year's consulship in absentia without having to be in Rome, without having to leave his province. He could be elected consul so that when he came back to Rome, he would then be consul and would still be immune from prosecution. So he was trying to come up with a compromise where he wouldn't be prosecuted for crimes uh, and he could continue his political career. But the Senate, once they had convinced Pompey to join their side, uh, they didn't want to budge. They thought they had Caesar trapped, and they thought that uh, Caesar would have to give up his position and end his political career. And so Caesar, you know, seeing this as a dead end, um, like I said, took a page out of Solo's book and took his army and marched on Rome directly, which he knew would initiate a, a civil war. Um, and uh, 
so, you know, a lot of people look up to Caesar and, and, and see him as this great military strategist and this great political thinker. And, uh, uh, you know, they admire him for his daring, um, you know, he, he always was willing, certainly, to roll the dice, as we shall see. Um, but you have to understand also that Caesar was an incredibly selfish individual that threw Rome into another civil war because, again, he did not want to end his own political career. Um, you know, he's, he's a selfish individual who uh, conquered an entire nation of Gaul. Uh, which which some people estimate resulted in the death of at least a million people and probably the enslavement of, of twice that many uh, in order to f further his own political career. So he was extremely ambitious, as, uh, uh, you know, as Shakespeare uh, will point out in, in his play. Uh, so Caesar coming to this dead end politically took his army, and marched it out of the province. So once he marched his army out of Cisalpine Gaul uh, in northern Italy, uh, he had no legal authority to really be in charge of that army anymore. So by marching the army out of the province, he was basically declaring civil war. The southern boundary of his province was a, a small river called the Rubicon River. And so when Caesar crossed the Rubicon River, he knew he was declaring war. He famously stated, Alea yacta est, which means the die has been cast, meaning there's no turning back now, marched his army across the Rubicon River, and then uh, made a beeline basically straight to, uh, straight to Rome. Uh, during the Gallic Wars, one of the things that made Caesar militarily so successful was his speed. Even when he was outnumbered, he ended up showing up someplace long before anybody expected him. And that element of surprise helped Caesar win uh, many uh, engagements in the, in the Gallic Wars. And he used the same thing here when he crossed the Rubicon River and headed towards Rome. He moved with such speed that the Senate and Pompey were not ready to defend Rome by the time he was at basically Rome's doorstep. And so the Senate and Pompey were forced to flee Rome. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Pompey felt that he had many legions that would fight for him, which he certainly did, um, but he couldn't gather them in time to put up an adequate defense of Rome. So the senators and Pompey were forced to abandon Rome and head south to Brindisium. Uh, to, uh, Brindisium is on the very heel tip of Italy uh, to cross over to um, uh, to cross over to Greece. Uh, when Caesar uh, ended up uh, basically. Um, in Rome, he ended up chasing Pompey uh, to Brindisium. Uh, many classes believe he wanted to basically uh, separate Pompey from those senators who were influencing him to maybe get Pompey back over on his side uh, and maybe uh, uh, end this conflict before it blew up into to a larger affair. Um, but he wasn't able to do it. He 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 took Rome, and then he marched on and headed towards Brindisium to chase Pompey and the senators, but he just missed them. Uh, they sailed across to Greece, and in Greece, Pompey was able to put together uh, a, a large army uh, on his own. And so Caesar eventually pursued our, uh, Pompey to Greece, and uh, there they fought a series of conflicts culminating in the, uh, the Battle of Pharsalus. In the Battle of Pharsalus, um, Caesar actually had um, basically a, a weaker position than Pompey. Uh, Pompey uh, had the higher ground at Pharsalus, and um, Pompey actually had more supplies than Caesar. Caesar's men were running out of uh, uh, food and um, uh, food and rations, and, and uh, they, they were basically uh, on the verge of starving. Uh, Pompey knew that all he had to do at the Battle of Pharsalus was, was wait a little bit longer, uh, weaken Caesar's army, and perhaps there wouldn't even be a battle. Uh, Caesar would just be forced to give up to Pompey the same way that Vercingetorix had been forced to give up to Caesar. Um, but the senators that were with Pompey uh, didn't, um, 
didn't agree with that strategy. They wanted a big battle against Caesar. They wanted to show that the, uh, that the Senate uh, decisively uh, defeated Caesar in a big battle. They saw that they had the higher ground and they saw that they outnumbered Caesar and so they were confident uh, in Pompey's victory over Caesar at Pharsalus. Uh, they were so confident that they even put out a, a feast, a victory feast for themselves uh, before the battle even started. Well, things did not go well for those senators uh, or for Pompey. Um, Caesar uh, offered battle and he hid a line of men behind some, some marshland uh, so that when Pompey attacked Caesar, um, his lines held pretty well. Uh, but when, I believe it was the right flank, started to fall back a little, Caesar sprang his trap, and the men that Pompey wasn't expecting kind of burst out of the marshland and took uh, Pompey's wing by surprise. Uh, that wing ended up falling back, retreating, basically collapsing, and Pompey's entire army ended up basically collapsing in upon itself, and Caesar ended up winning the day. He actually uh, uh, pushed forward and, and captured uh, the headquarters tent uh, of Pompey, where he saw that feast laid out uh, that the senators had, had put out before the battle. Uh, uh, you know, kind of overconfident in their victory. Pompey himself was forced to dress like some kind of slave to, uh, to escape from the battlefield and uh, hopefully to, to fight again another day. Uh, once Pompey escaped from the Battle of Pharsalus, uh, he headed to Egypt. You remember uh, during Pompey's campaigns in the east uh, that he had went down to Egypt to help Ptolemy XII. Uh, stay on the throne. So Pompey felt that he personally had helped Ptolemy the Twelfth, and so that the, uh, the the pharaohs in Egypt, the Ptolemaic family, uh, would in return uh, help him, Pompey the Great, in his time of need here. And Egypt was a very wealthy nation, and so if Pompey needed to regroup and to build another army, he could certainly do so in Egypt. Uh, however, uh, Ptolemy the Twelfth by this time is dead, and his young son, uh, Ptolemy the Thirteenth uh, was in control at Alexandria. Ptolemy the Thirteenth himself was embroiled in a civil war with his sister slash wife Cleopatra the Seventh, and uh, so Ptolemy the Thirteenth, um, you know, he knew what had happened at Pharsalus. Word had reached him that uh, Pompey had lost, that Caesar had won, and I guess Ptolemy the Thirteenth or his advisors kind of saw the writing on the wall. And, knew, and didn't want to be on the losing side of this civil war between Caesar and Pompey. And so when Pompey arrived on the beach uh, in near Alexandria, um, Ptolemy XIII ordered to have Pompey killed. And very unceremoniously, Pompey was killed and beheaded on the beach near Alexandria. His head was brought to Ptolemy XIII, and Ptolemy the Thirteenth intended to present this head to Julius Caesar when surely Julius Caesar would come in pursuit of Pompey. So um, let's see. So Julius Caesar did, in fact, uh, pursue Pompey to Egypt, and when he arrived at Egypt, uh, he was welcomed by Ptolemy the Thirteenth, and Ptolemy the Thirteenth uh, presented him. Uh, with a gift, the, the head of his enemy, Pompey Magnus. Caesar reacted very differently than Ptolemy the Thirteenth uh, was hoping. Uh, Caesar wept when he saw the head of Pompey the Great. Um, it may have been a, a sincere sadness Caesar felt uh, when seeing uh, the dead head of his one-time son-in-law, Remember, Pompey had been married to Caesar's daughter and had been a, a close political ally of Caesar when he had become consul. Uh, you know, only in the most recent times had, had, uh, had they been fighting against each other. And, um, uh, you know, and, and even during this time, some people believe that, that Caesar was trying to separate Pompey from the senators in order to, um, uh, to get him back on his side. Uh, some people even predict that maybe Caesar wanted to catch up with Pompey 
and then show forgiveness to Pompey. Caesar is famous for showing forgiveness to his enemies uh, during these civil wars. Um, you know, a lot of the senators that had fought against him, including Cicero and Brutus and Cassius, uh, were all uh, shown forgiveness uh, when, they, when they gave up to Caesar after the Battle of Pharsalus, and they were allowed to return back to Rome, and they were allowed to continue their political career. Um, you know, those same senators, Brutus and Cassius and, and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, many of them, uh, ended up uh, basically conspiring against Caesar. So this, this ended up uh, basically resulting in his death eventually. But, um, but one of the things that Caesar perhaps wanted to do was show the greatest forgiveness of all by forgiving Pompey the Great, who, who had the most power against him. Uh, kind of as a military enemy. Um, so some people would say that that's the reason, perhaps, why Caesar wept. Uh, perhaps uh, Caesar, you know, the, the Romans had kind of a grudging respect for the Egyptians. They knew that the Egyptian uh, civilization had begun long before the Roman civilization had begun. Uh, they knew that, um, you know, they, they respected the ancientness of the Egyptian civilization, and, and they knew that the Ptolemy family uh, had descended from Alexander the Great, that Ptolemy was one of Alexander the Great's generals, uh, the original Ptolemy. And uh, so they had a respect for the Egyptians, but at the same time, they, they also considered them kind of barbarians as well, you know, uh, not Roman. Uh, so because of that, you know, Caesar may have wept to see this once great Roman, this great general who had conquered these vast lands for Rome, uh, be brought so low by a group of people that Caesar may have considered barbarians. Um, however, there's a, a pragmatic reason why Caesar reacted negatively uh, to the death of Pompey. He's going to use this as an excuse to interfere in Egyptian politics. So Egypt, like I said, was one of the wealthiest areas in the Mediterranean, and uh, uh, there was there happened to be a civil war going on in Egypt at this time. Uh, Ptolemy the Thirteenth was in control of Alexandria, but his sister slash wife Cleopatra the uh, Seventh was um, uh, was was going up against him uh, for control of Egypt, and so Caesar saw this as an opportunity to basically do the same thing that he had been doing in Gaul, basically uh, get involved in these intra-Nacene uh, conflicts. And uh, um, uh, by getting involved and by putting who he wanted in charge, um, he would have firmer control himself uh, of that area. And Egypt was certainly a rich prize for Caesar to, to want to take control of. And so, uh, you know, he... He reacted negatively, even though perhaps part of him is relieved that this, this enemy, Pompey, who could have raised another army and who could have defeated him, uh, was dead. You know, I mean, that was probably a little bit of a relief to Caesar, no matter what he was thinking. Um, he's going to use this as an excuse, something bad that Ptolemy the Thirteenth has done, in order to, again, intervene in these Egyptian politics here. And so... Um, it, it's said that while Caesar was the guest of Ptolemy the Thirteenth in the palace in Alexandria, uh, Cleopatra the Seventh, uh, a little bit older, a, a teenager still, she was eighteen I think at the time, um, uh, but older than her brother slash husband Ptolemy the the Thirteenth, uh, she had herself smuggled inside the palace in a in a rolled up carpet, and she had herself smuggled directly into to Caesar's bedroom. And there she convinced, persuaded Caesar to support her as the sole ruler of Egypt. So Caesar does that. He joins forces with Cleopatra the Seventh, um, and he um, uh, a war breaks out called the Alexandrian War. Uh, Caesar's uh, arrived in Alexandria with only one legion. He he wanted to pursue. Pompey so quickly that he had only brought one legion with him. And so Caesar, with his one legion, uh, with possible more reinforcements coming, uh, fights this war against uh, Ptolemy the Thirteenth and, uh, uh, you know, his uh, uh, Greco-Egyptian soldiers uh, in Alexandria. Uh, it's a very uh, urban kind of fighting that Caesar has to do where uh, uh, basically Caesar and Cleopatra are held up in the palace and they have to take over the city block by block 
uh, with their legions. Uh, but eventually, Caesar and Cleopatra win. Ptolemy the Thirteenth ends up dead, and Caesar uh, promotes Cleopatra as the the pharaoh of Egypt, the 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 sole ruler uh, of the country. Uh, Caesar then spends some time in Egypt with Cleopatra. Uh, they go on a river cruise down the Nile River. Uh, they visit the tomb of Alexander the Great, and uh, um, during that time, Caesar and Cleopatra uh, are reported to have a child, which Cleopatra will name Caesarian, to emphasize that this is Julius Caesar's child, Julius Caesar's son. But Julius Caesar, even though he spends some time in Egypt, uh, can't spend forever there. He still has some political enemies that are fighting against him. Amongst them is Cato the Younger, that one political enemy of Caesar that was constantly arguing against him in the Senate that was always his political enemy. Uh, Cato the Younger has put together another army in North Africa, and uh, Caesar has to go off and, and fight Cato the Younger. Uh, so he... Um, he defeats Cato the Younger in North Africa, uh, near a town called Utica, or Utica. Um, and then uh, Cato the Younger, after that battle, ends up committing suicide. He stabs himself uh, with a dagger. Um, his assistants come in and try to bandage him up. But when he recovers consciousness and sees that they were trying to save his life and bandage him up, he, he rips the band-aids off and... Uh, um, you know, uh, uh, commits to uh, uh, dying, basically. So Cato the Younger dies this kind of uh, uh, self-inflicted death uh, after the Battle of Utica. Uh, he would not be taken alive or shown clemency by uh, Julius Caesar. Uh, after Julius Caesar fights this battle in, in North Africa, uh, uh, supposedly this is the point when he says, "Wany, weedy, weaky, the famous phrase, I came, I saw, I conquered. Um, he heads, uh, he heads back to Rome, uh, but isn't able to stay there for long. There is a, a, a final, um, uh, group of people that are, um, amassing an army in Spain, uh, against him. Uh, some final Pompeian supporters, uh, uh, one of Pom one of Pompey's sons and, uh, uh, one of, uh, Julius Caesar's old lieutenants, um, Labienus, one of his right-hand men. In, uh, in the Gallic Wars, who turned to Pompey's side during the Civil War, um, is, uh, is building an army against him in Spain. So Julius Caesar has to head up to Spain then and uh, fight, uh, uh, fight those enemies, and he, he does defeat them, though he says that was one of the hardest-fought battles uh, that he had ever fought. Um, and it was during this time when he was fighting in Spain at uh, what's called the Battle of Munda uh, that... Um, uh, his young nephew, uh, Octavian, comes and uh, uh, visits him uh, uh, in the aftermath of this battle. And Octavian had set out to visit him even before he knew the outcome of the battle, unlike uh, a lot of different um, you know, political sycophants who, who went to go uh, uh, you know, congratulate him only after they found out he had won the battle. And Octavian uh, was Julius Caesar's nephew, and he was always a very sickly young man. He, he was always getting sick. And so for him to take, make such a vast journey to go visit Julius Caesar uh, made an impression on Julius Caesar. And on his journey back to Rome, uh, Caesar spent a lot of time talking with Octavian. And Octavian must have made a further impression on him because when Caesar returned back to Rome, he changed his will so that, um, so that he acknowledged Octavian as his heir should Julius Caesar die. Now, Octavian doesn't know this yet, but that's what Caesar puts in his will uh, after the Battle of Munda. Uh, once he's back in Rome, uh, he basically uh, declares himself dictator, uh, again using that page out of Sulla's book, and he wants to make himself dictator for life. Uh, he celebrates some triumphs. A triumph was uh, basically a parade through the city, um, uh, celebrating his victories in Gaul, and uh, uh, you know, it was you weren't supposed to celebrate a triumph against a a, a fellow Roman in a civil war, so um, he basically uh, made it seem like he you know had fought foreign powers, uh, even though uh, it was in the midst of these civil wars uh, in his triumphs. 
Uh, he initiated a bunch of building projects, and he also reformed the calendar to give us our 365-day calendar that we have today with a one-day leap year um, every four years. And he also renamed the month of, uh, I believe it was, Quintilis after himself. Uh, that's why we call July, July after Julius Caesar. However, once he was back in control of Rome, for, for those reasons, for, uh, for making himself dictator for life, uh, and for showing leniency to all of his military enemies, all of his political enemies who were back in Rome and, and continuing their political careers, uh, a conspiracy developed against him, uh, which uh, would lead to his assassination. Um, so uh, two of the people that he had uh, shown leniency to after the Civil War, uh, Gaius Cassius Longinus, and Marcus Junius Brutus um, formed a conspiracy to assassinate Julius Caesar. Brutus happened to be Servilia's son. So uh, remember, uh, Caesar had had a love affair with Servilia uh, earlier in his life. And some people believe that Brutus uh, may have possibly actually been Julius Caesar's son. I mean, we'll never know for sure. Um, but some people posit that. It's interesting because, as I said, Julius Caesar made Octavian uh, his sole heir should something happen to him. But in his will, it's stipulated that if Octavian died before Caesar did, and then Caesar died, then Brutus was second in line uh, to be recognized as Julius Caesar's heir. So everybody knows that Julius Caesar was assassinated famously on the Ides of March in 44 B.C., um, and uh, he, uh, the Ides of March is the 15th of March. There's a reason why he was assassinated on the 15th of March, uh, not just because they thought, you know, the, the full moon and, you know, it was the middle of the month, uh, but because he was planning to begin, initiate another military campaign uh, on March 18th, only, only a few days later. He was going to gather his army and march off to Parthia, which, remember, is in the Middle East, uh, and uh, take vengeance on the Parthians for defeating uh, those Rome, that, that, that Roman army that had been led by Crassus, for killing his uh, longtime political ally, Marcus Crassus, and for, um, uh, for taking the, the eagle standards of the, um, uh, of the army that, that had been defeated, of the Roman army that had been defeated. So Caesar planned to march off to Parthia and defeat Parthia, in the same way that Alexander the Great kind of hurled himself against Persia. Um, and then, after defeating Parthia, Caesar even planned to swoop back around through Germany and conquer Germany on his way back to Rome. Uh, so the senators knew that if he went off and accomplished only half of what he set out to do, he would come back the greatest general ever, and he would basically be untouchable after that point. So they felt there was a very small window of opportunity in which to do something about him. So before he set off for Parthia, they assassinated him on March 15th, 44 BC. Um, they didn't assassinate him in the Senate House where it stands today, in the Forum. Um, that Senate House had actually been burned down. I had mentioned earlier there was this political rabble-rouser uh, named Clodius Pauker. Clodius Pauker had actually been supported by Julius Caesar at one point. Uh, when, when, um, uh, during the first triumvirate, when Cicero refused to take part in this alliance that Caesar, Pompey, and Crassus were making, um, Caesar basically uh, supported Clodius as tribune so that Clodius could come up with that ex post facto law and get rid of Cicero, get him out of town, uh, while Julius Caesar attempted his takeover. Uh, it was only later, uh, uh, years later, that, that, that Cicero was allowed to, to come back into Rome on Pompey's invitation. Um, and so there was that rabble-rouser, Clodius, uh, who was a big political enemy of Cicero. However, Cicero did not lay down and just take whatever Clodius was throwing at him. Uh, Cicero came up with his own rabble-rouser, a guy named Milo. And there were these constant street battles happening in the, in the street of Rome where, where different gangs, the gangs of Clodius, were fighting against the gangs of Milo. And it was a very violent time just in the everyday streets of Rome. 
at that time. And at one point, uh, Clodius uh, and Milo's gangs uh, basically confronted each other near the Appian Way, and Clodius himself was killed uh, uh, by Milo's gangs. Uh, Clodius supporters then took Clodius's body to the Forum, to the Senate House, and cremated Clodius's body right there at the Senate House, burning down the entire Senate House with it. Um, and so the old Senate House, the Senate House in the Forum, had been burned down recently uh, well, during Clodius's, uh, uh cremation. And so the Senate was using... Um, the Theater of Pompey, a building sponsored and built by Pompey with a giant statue of Pompey in it, um, as their meeting place while the, the Senate House in the Forum was being rebuilt. And it was in this new meeting place, the Theater of Pompey, that Julius Caesar was assassinated. So some people you know, think it ironic that Julius Caesar was assassinated underneath this giant statue of his, one of his greatest uh, um, you know, political and military foes. Uh, Pompey. Uh, the senators, you know, uh, uh, met him at the Senate House and stabbed him uh, supposedly 23 times. Uh, Shakespeare reports that Julius Caesar's last words were, et tu brute, which means even you, Brutus. Remember, et can be, can be translated and or even. So even you, Brutus, I think is a, a better translation than and you, Brutus. Um, you know, some people say say that Caesar said something like "et tu Philly," perhaps, like or even "you son," or even said that in Greek instead. Uh, and other people say that Caesar really didn't say anything. I mean, he was stabbed twenty three times. He just tried to feebly kind of cover himself up and give himself some dignity as he bled out uh, to death. Um, the senators were hoping that by killing Julius Caesar, that they would be seen as liberators who freed. Uh, uh, the Republic of somebody who was trying to make themselves king. Uh, you know, Brutus himself, um, if he wasn't Julius Caesar's son, uh, Brutus, uh, Brutus was the most recent in the line uh, that, dated, that went all the way back to, uh, uh, to the original uh, Brutus who had kicked out the last king of Rome. So there was this pressure on Brutus, this, this pressure to live up to his family name and to uh, get rid of somebody who was trying to make themselves a tyrant. And uh, uh, so the, the conspirators had thought that they would be welcomed as liberators, um, but they weren't. Uh, when people heard that Julius Caesar was dead, uh, they shuttered their windows and they were hoping that no more, you know, they, they were just waiting for the next round of violence to kind of spill over. And so in this, um, uh, in this setting, uh, Julius Caesar's right-hand man during the Civil Wars, Mark Antony, uh, kind of stepped up. He, he was the one serving as consul that year, so he was the one who had uh, uh, the real political authority. And all of those senators, even the conspirators that had attacked Julius Caesar, had all been granted you know, political positions by Julius Caesar. And so... Uh, um, so they decided to keep Julius Caesar's acts going and keep everybody in power. So the senators, kind of the, the conspirators, remained uh, in their own positions. But that kept Mark Antony as, as consul of Rome. And so he was the one who was really in control of the city. And he delivered a funeral oration uh, uh, to, the, to the people um, after Julius Caesar's death. And, and he showed the bloody toga of Julius Caesar to the common people, and he reminded the people of all of the good things that Julius Caesar did for them, and how popular he was amongst the common people. And he basically whipped the crowd into a frenzy against the uh, um, the conspirators. Uh, you know, this this all gets into kind of Shakespeare's uh, uh, historical tragedy of Julius Caesar, um, and. The, the people were in such a frenzy against the conspirators that the, the, Senate, the senators who, who had killed Julius Caesar were forced to flee the city. Um, one of the, uh, uh, there was actually even a, a, one senator, uh, or actually one poet, uh, Cinna the poet, who uh, was killed by the mob, uh, thinking that he was uh, one of the senators, and, and he actually wasn't, he was, he was actually a poet. Um, so, uh, the... Mark Antony was instrumental 
and basically uh, driving the senators out of the city of Rome. And it was at that point that the senators basically fled to different areas. Uh, you know, some of them fled out to Spain. Uh, some of them went to Greece again to organize an army to fight against um, basically the the descendants of Caesar, the people who were uh, uh, still supporting Caesar, people like Mark Antony. But as I said, in addition to Mark Antony, um, Caesar had somebody else who was kind of destined to be um, to take over after Caesar. The, the person that he declared was his sole heir in his will, his young nephew Octavian. Octavian was studying in Greece at the time when he heard that uh, Julius Caesar had been assassinated, and he also heard that uh, basically overnight he had become extremely rich, that all of Julius Caesar's uh, property and money would go to him. But even more importantly than the property and money was, uh, since Octavian was adopted posthumously as like Julius Caesar's son, he could take Julius Caesar's name. And he suddenly had a whole group of soldiers, uh, veterans of Caesar, that were willing to, to follow him. Because remember, all of these soldiers, this army that Julius Caesar had that fought with him in Gaul, that fought with him in the Civil War, uh, they were more loyal to Caesar than they were really to the government. And they saw Caesar as their patron. You know, in, in Rome, we had that patron-client relationship where a wealthier patron or a more powerful patron kind of protects their clients. And uh, they saw Caesar as their patron, and they saw themselves as clients. So that patron-client uh, patron relationship in Rome is a hereditary one. So when the old patron dies, whoever that patron's son is becomes the new patron. So Octavian, to the eyes of many of Caesar's veterans, became uh, their new general. And so overnight, basically, young Octavian found himself with a great deal of money, with the name Julius Caesar, and with a mass of soldiers willing to follow his commands and die for him. So Octavian returns to Rome, accepts the posthumous adoption of Caesar, and uh, uh, basically uh, works to give himself some political influence in Rome. Now, back in Rome, one person who was not involved in the assassination of Julius Caesar, who remained in Rome, was an aging Cicero. Uh, Cicero is still around, and, and he's trying to basically uh, strike a middle ground between uh, you know, the, the conservatives and the, the Caesarians uh, in the Senate. When Cicero sees what's happening now with Mark Antony in control of Rome and this young Octavian coming who also looks to uh, have some influence with troops and things, uh, Cicero sees Octavian as the lesser of two evils. He maybe even sees Octavian as somebody Cicero he himself can kind of control. Mark Antony, on the other hand, uh, Cicero sees as kind of this debauched, um, you know, kind of idiot that... Uh, has no place kind of running the government. Uh, so Cicero supports Octavian uh, in, in elevating Octavian to power. Um, and he writes a series of speeches against Mark Antony uh, called the Philippics. Uh, the Philippics were named after a series of speeches that were written against uh, King Philip of Macedon. Uh, in Greece, uh, kind of warning Greece against the growing power of Macedonia. So in the same way, Cicero was trying to warn the Romans against the abusive power of, of Mark Antony. And he says these scathing things, these horrible things about Mark Antony in his Philippics. And the Philippics do work in a way to, to decrease Mark Antony's popular support in Rome. Uh, Mark Antony always enjoyed a good deal of popular support in Rome. He was always seen as kind of... Uh, uh, you know, uh, a more laid back, uh, a more kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, I, I guess you would say um, uh, a man's man uh, back in Rome. Uh, uh, you know, he, he had a great rapport with his soldiers and uh, uh, with the common citizens as well. Uh, but Cicero's um, 
uh, Philippics, uh, saying all these nasty things against Mark Antony, uh, really did sow some, um, uh, you know, uh, basically put a crack in, in the popular support Mark Antony uh, followed in Rome. Uh, and so Cicero supported Octavian uh, over Mark Antony, and he kind of tried to pit Octavian against Mark Antony. At one point, the Senate, uh, uh, Mark, Antony, Mark Antony was driven from the city, and the Senate sent uh, an army against Mark Antony. And Octavian went to go fight uh, against Mark Antony um, uh, to, um, uh, you know, on bequest of the, on bequest of the Senate. Um, the two consuls who were in charge of the Roman army ended up dying. Uh, Octavian ended up surviving and drove Mark Antony off into the mountains. Um, but then Octavian came back to Rome and took his army and he marched on Rome. Uh, and so here's young Octavian, who's just a teenager basically, he took this army, he marched on Rome, and he made himself consul of Rome, uh, being one of the youngest consuls you know, ever, and, and never really having held any political position before that. So Cicero's plan kind of backfired here. He thought that Octavian would be somebody who was easier to control or, or uh, the lesser of two evils against Mark Antony. And here Octavian is marching on Rome and making himself consul of Rome. After making himself consul of Rome, uh, Octavian reaches out to Mark Antony and joins forces with Mark Antony because Octavian knows that even all the soldiers that follow him are not going to be enough to fight against the soldiers that Brutus and Cassius are gathering together in Greece. So he has to join forces with Mark Antony. And they form um, a, a, uh, a true triumvirate, uh, where they basically get rid of having elections for a consul every year, or two consuls every year, and have three people, uh, an old general of Julius Caesar named Lepidus, Mark Antony and Octavian, who are in complete control of Roman government. Uh, this wasn't a totally new thing. I mean, there was some precedent for it, you know, way back during the time when Rome was writing its first laws in the Twelve Tables. Uh, they turned complete control of the Republic over to a decemvirate, a group of ten men who, for the time that the, the Twelve Tables were being written, uh, uh, basically had control of government. Uh, so there was a little bit of precedent, but it was kind of a suspension of the Republic and this idea that just these three people, uh, Mark Antony, Octavian, and Lepidus, were in complete control of the Roman government. Uh, before we move on, the, the three figures that you see in the picture right here uh, are actually not Mark Antony, Lepidus, and Octavian, but rather Octavian, Agrippa, and Mycenaeus. Um, we wonder why... Octavian ended up being as successful as he was. Uh, he was as successful as he was because he had great friends. We should all wish to have as great of friends as Octavian had. Uh, he had a military advisor named Agrippa. Agrippa had been his friend ever since he was a young, ever since he was a young man. Uh, when um, uh, Agrippa's father had gotten into some trouble with Julius Caesar. Uh, where he was caught, you know, conspiring against Julius Caesar. At first, Julius Caesar forgave him and showed him leniency like Julius Caesar did for most of his political enemies. But Agrippa's father got caught up again uh, in a conspiracy against Julius Caesar. And usually when you were caught twice plotting against Julius Caesar, uh, that meant the end of you. Um, at the time, Octavian didn't know whether Julius Caesar even knew his name. Like, you know, Julius Caesar was this uncle of his that... Uh, was successful and had all of this power, but Octavian was kind of in the background. Uh, but Octavian kind of stuck his neck out and, and put in a, a word for Agrippa uh, uh, to Julius Caesar to, to have Julius Caesar spare Agrippa's father's life a second time. And Agrippa never forgot that. And so Agrippa will always remain loyal to Octavian. Uh, Agrippa himself doesn't come from you know, as powerful or influential a family as Octavian does. Uh, so another reason why Agrippa is going to stick with Octavian is because Octavian will offer him the kind of power that he would have never hoped to get on his own. But Agrippa himself is uh, uh, basically a, a talented military leader. Uh, so when I say that Octavian wins a military battle, it's really not Octavian that wins the military battle. It's more likely Agrippa that wins the military battle, and then he gives all the glory to Octavian. Uh, 
So you see Agrippa as this talented military leader that has this fierce loyalty to Octavian. And the other guy with uh, Octavian right there is Mycenaeus. Mycenaeus is a political advisor to Octavian. And so oftentimes when I say, you know, Octavian had this great political idea, a lot of times maybe Mycenaeus was the one who was behind that political idea. Mycenaeus will also be the one who, uh, when Octavian eventually becomes emperor, uh, will uh, hire poets, uh, basically be the patron to Virgil and Horace, um, to write poetry, to support the new regime. So Mycenaeus becomes kind of a political advisor, a master of propaganda, kind of a PR person. So Mycenaeus also uh, plays a central role in Octavian's uh, uh, you know, burgeoning government. Um, so uh, uh, Octavian has those two people. Uh, Agrippa and Mycenaeus on his side. And at the same time, he's joined forces with Mark Antony and Lepidus uh, to basically put a suspension to the Republic. And uh, uh, the three of them seem to be in complete control of Rome. And they've joined forces to fight against Brutus and Cassius, the assassins of Julius Caesar, who are now amassing a huge army up in Greece. So uh, Antony, Lepidus, and... Uh, uh, Octavian uh, basically split the empire between themselves and then joined forces um, to fight against uh, Brutus and Cassius. Uh, they go over to Greece and they fight the battle of Philippi in Greece. So th these are some important battles and you should, you should you know, keep track of them. Uh, Pharsalus was in Greece, another PH word. That was the one where Julius Caesar defeated Pompey. Philippi is also in Greece. Uh, that's the one where Antony and Octavian and Lepidus join together the triumvirate, defeats the assassins, Brutus and Cassius. Um, in this battle, Aunt Mark Antony is really seen as the great hero of the battle. This is the high point of Mark Antony's career. Mark Antony is the one that overruns uh, uh, the assassins' camp and basically almost single-handedly wins the battle. Octavian kind of gets sick before the battle and ends up in the headquarters tent through most of the battle. And his own camp is overrun by Brutus's men. And he ends up having to basically run out into the, into the uh, marshland uh, and hide out there uh, uh, while he's listening for, for what the result of the battle is. Uh, but as I said, Mark Antony overran the assassin's camp. And uh, Brutus, even though he was able to capture Octavian's tent, um, when he found out that his camp had been overrun and that Cassius was dead, uh, Brutus ended up committing suicide. And uh, uh, so Antony and Octavian and the Triumvirate end up winning the battle, though it was quite clear that Mark Antony was the one who, who really won the battle. Uh, so, as I said, uh, the three men, Lepidus, uh, Mark Antony and Octavian split up the empire between themselves. And uh, um, they also order uh, uh, prescriptions. So they're not going to be as lenient as Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar you know, showed his, his um, political enemies leniency and he ended up getting assassinated. So Octavian and Mark Antony, in a very cold-blooded, calculated kind of way, uh, end up writing these, these prescription lists. Uh, listing their political enemies, which will both get rid of any political enemies they have in Rome and also acquire more money to pay for their armies. Um, and in this round of prescriptions, you know, the, the same kind of thing that Sulla did, uh, uh, write these prescription lists, these hit lists the, that make it legal to kill, uh, you know, these political enemies of theirs, even though they're Roman citizens, and then to... Uh, seize their property. Um, in these prescriptions, the most famous person to have died is Cicero. Uh, so remember, Cicero was kind of Octavian's friend, but uh, Mark Antony hated him. He hated those speeches, the Philippics, that Cicero had written against him. And uh, uh, so Mark Antony insisted that Cicero go on the prescription lists. And so Cicero was famously killed during this round of prescriptions. His head and hands were cut off and nailed uh, to the rostrum, the speaker's platform in the forum, uh, where he had delivered so many speeches and, and presided over so many law cases. Uh, 
it's said that Mark Antony's wife then went to the, the head of, um, uh, of Cicero and took the hairpin out of her hair and pinned down his tongue so that he couldn't say any more bad things about her husband. Uh, so Cicero famously dies in this round of prescriptions. Um, but the triumvirs, they use these prescriptions, they get rid of their political enemies, they amass a large amount of money, they pay for their army, and they defeat the assassins at the Battle of Philippi. And so the Battle of Philippi is important because it really represents the end of the Republic. You know, uh, we're talking about the Roman Revolution here and how the, the, the government changed from being a Republic to becoming an empire. And uh, neither Antony or Octavian had any real interest in restoring the Republic, even though Octavian will eventually say that what he did was restore the Republic. They really have, and even though the, the, um, the triumvirate that they called themselves was supposed to be to restore the Republic, they really, both of them really were looking to, to consolidate supreme power in their own hands. Uh, the last people fighting for kind of the old Republic was Brutus and Cassius. And so uh, uh, the senators and the, the, their deaths at the Battle of Philippi really was the nail in the coffin uh, for, the, uh, for the Republic. All right. So basically, they, they split up, like I said, the Roman Empire, the three triumvirs, Lepidus gets uh, Africa, um, uh, Octavian controls the western provinces, and Mark Antony is going to control the eastern province. He's going to go east. He's supposed to go east and fight the Parthians. Again, do that thing that Julius Caesar wanted to do, uh, where he goes over to Parthia and takes vengeance on the Parthians for defeating that Roman army, uh, now almost a generation earlier, and then capturing those eagles and things. So Antony heads east. Octavian stays west. But Octavian basically has all these issues back in, back in Italy. Uh, first of all, the grain supply has been cut off in Italy. Uh, uh, Lepidus seems to be kind of trying to make a bid for power himself or trying to become a kingmaker uh, and cuts off grain from North Africa. And Sextus Pompey, one of the final remaining sons of Pompey the Great, uh, has kind of become a pirate and taken control of Sicily and cut off the grain supply from Sicily to Italy. So Octavian has to deal with this... Um, uh, basically, uh, this shortage of grain uh, in Italy. And by this time, uh, remember I said before that Gaius Gracchus, you know, way back at the beginning of this, that Gaius Gracchus had subsidized Roman grain uh, as a step to making grain completely free for Romans. Well, uh, Clodius Pocare, remember that rabble-rousing politician who was an enemy of Cicero, uh, Clodius Pocare, uh, actually did make grain completely free for Roman citizens. So by, the t by this time, Roman citizens were used to having their grain completely free. Uh, Clodius had made grain free because Clodius was buying up a bunch of slaves and then setting them free, and he wouldn't have to worry about feeding them, and they could uh, add to the numbers of his growing street gangs that were fighting in the streets of Rome. So Clodius uh, uh, had made grain free, and so by this time, like I said, uh, the citizens of Rome, all citizens, rich and poor, uh, were used to free, getting free grain. And uh, so the grain supply was being cut off from North Africa and from Sicily, where the grain mostly came from. And um, Octavian was having to fight these battles uh, against Sextus Pompey. Uh, he quickly basically neutralized Lepidus and, 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 and took quick control back of North Africa. But, uh, but he was having to fight Sextus Pompey, the pirate, um, and uh, uh, he was having mixed success with that. Uh, Lepidus, by the way, like I said, Octavian kind of uh, neutralized Lepidus's bid for power. He allowed Lepidus to live, though. Lepidus kind of would remain alive and would actually outlive Mark Antony. Uh, eventually, he'd simply die of old age, and, uh, 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 and he would see Rome transformed into uh, the, the emperorship of, uh, uh, of Octavian. Of course, Octavian didn't call himself emperor. Uh, but we'll get to that later. Um, so Octavian neutralized Lepidus, but it was having mixed success against uh, Sextus Pompey. So he had to come to an agreement with, um, uh, with Mark Antony. Uh, it seemed like things were starting to fall apart between him and Mark Antony as well. And uh, 
they had led their armies to fight off against each other, so Octavian against Mark Antony, at Brindisium. Remember, Brindisium is right at the heel point of Italy. Um, and uh, by this time, um, you know, this is one of those situations where they say, you know, what if they called a war and nobody came to fight it? Uh, the soldiers, the Roman soldiers on Mark Antony's side and Octavian's side who were facing against each other at Brindisium were basically just getting sick and tired of all the civil war, killing their brothers and, and, and their fathers and their uncles and, and constantly fighting against their fellow Romans. So they refused to fight at Brindisium. So the soldiers actually refused to fight at Brindisium. And uh, Antony and Octavian were forced to come to terms. And so they... Uh, they made up basically. They 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 re uh, um, re cemented their their alliance between each other, and they solidified that alliance by um, Octavian had Mark Antony marry his sister Octavia. So uh, again, Octavian had a sister named Octavia, and he, acting as the oldest male in the household, arranged for her to marriage Mark Antony to seal the political alliance between him and Mark Antony. And also there was an agreement that um, Mark Antony would provide uh, some ships and uh, part of his navy uh, to Octavian so that Octavian could continue his fight against Sextus Pompey and Octavian would send some soldiers over to Mark Antony so Mark Antony could go off and do what he was supposed to do and fight the Parthians and take vengeance on Parthia. Um, what ends up happening is that Mark Antony gives the ships to Octavian, but Octavian never sends the soldiers over to Mark Antony. And so this, again, just immediately begins the split between them again. Uh, what um, Mark Antony ends up doing, though, is basically heading off to Egypt, where he joins up with Cleopatra. So uh, uh, when Mark Antony's in the east, he joins up with Cleopatra, and he actually really falls in love with Cleopatra. Uh, back earlier, uh, when Mark Antony was the one in charge of Rome, when he was consul of Rome, uh, they were calling back all the client kings to Rome to renegotiate their status with Rome. And Cleopatra had come to Rome in this magnificent barge, uh, this huge ship to show off all of the wealth of Egypt. And she had such an impression on Mark Antony that they kind of fell in love there way back when they were in Rome. Uh, but now that Antony is... Back in, um, back in the East, he meets up with Cleopatra again. Uh, Antony and Cleopatra actually spend quite a bit of time together and have several children together. Um, but remember, Mark Antony is married to Octavian's wife, Octavia, uh, at this time. And um, uh, so Octavian uses this kind of as propaganda against Mark Antony. He says, look at Mark Antony. Uh, uh, he sends his sister Octavia over to Mark Antony uh, to see what will happen. Uh, he knows that Mark Antony is with Cleopatra. He knows that Mark Antony depends on Cleopatra. That, you know, that, remember, Octavian never sent him the soldiers that he needed. So, uh, so Mark Antony depends on the wealth that Cleopatra has in the kingdom of Egypt and the soldiers that she provides him. So he knows that Mark Antony is dependent on Cleopatra. But he sends his sister anyhow. Um, you know, it's quite possible that Mark Antony might have killed Octavia you know, under Cleopatra's orders. So imagine being sent by your own brother to, uh, to Egypt um, to meet with your husband, who you know is with this other woman, knowing that he might kill you, um, but your brother does it anyhow, because no matter what Mark Antony does, it'll make uh, Octavian look good. Uh, so Mark Antony doesn't end up killing Octavia. He ends up sending her back. But Octavian uses this as propaganda, saying, see how Mark Antony has rejected his good Roman wife uh, in favor of this Egyptian queen who has seemed to have seduced him. Um, in addition to that, uh, Mark Antony kind of plays into Octavian's uh, propaganda. 
he holds these festivals in the city of Alexandria where he dresses up as the god Osiris and Cleopatra dresses up as the goddess Isis. And uh, they parade their children that they have together and talk about how they're going to give parts of the Roman Empire uh, to uh, Mark Antony's children with Cleopatra. You notice that Remember Julius Caesar had a, had a son with Cleopatra that Cleopatra um, you know named Caesarian to highlight the 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 point that this was uh, Julius Caesar's son. Notice that that boy Caesarian never received anything after Julius Caesar died because the Senate and the people back in Rome would have never recognized uh, a child that Julius Caesar had, you know, basically uh, uh, with a non-Roman citizen uh, out of wedlock. You know, uh, uh, they would only recognize an heir that Julius Caesar had if he had a child with his own wife or if he, uh, as he did, uh, posthumously adopted an heir in his will, somebody who was a Roman citizen. Uh, so Caesarian would have never been recognized by the government back in Rome, uh, but Caesarian is still living there with, uh, with Cleopatra. And here's Mark Antony with his children with Cleopatra, uh, acting as if he's going to give parts of the Roman Empire to those children. Uh, this, these festivals that Mark Antony and Cleopatra were holding in, um, in Alexandria uh, were known as the Donations of Alexandria. And again, Octavian used that as propaganda against Mark Antony. He says, look, he's acting like some kind of Eastern despot, giving away parts of the Roman Empire to his Egyptian children. One last thing that uh, Octavian did was he broke open Mark Antony's will. Now, now th you weren't supposed to do this. You weren't supposed to break open somebody's will until after they died. But in his will that was kept in Rome in the Temple of Vesta, uh, he again reiterated the idea that he was going to give parts of the Roman Empire to his Egyptian children, which um, the conservative senators in the Senate and the people in Rome saw was a complete betrayal of Rome. So they saw Antony as kind of heading over to the east and and uh, basically going native, uh, 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 abandoning his Roman ways and, and embracing uh, uh, these foreign kind of uh, these foreign kind of ways and becoming not Roman, and so Octavian used all of this propaganda: the rejection of his sister, the donations of Alexandria, the will of Mark Antony, in order to induce the Senate uh, to declare war not against Mark Antony but against Cleopatra. And this is the final kind of set of civil wars that the late Republic will have to endure. And so finally, again, for a second time now, uh, Mark Antony and uh, Octavian uh, face off against each other. And um, uh, the battle between them is a naval battle near Greece called the Battle of Actium. Now, the Battle of Achaean was not really a huge battle. It, it was almost kind of like a minor naval skirmish. But uh, during the battle, uh, Cleopatra, who was president of the battle and who was in charge of the treasury ship, uh, when she saw the battle going against uh, her and Mark Antony, she sailed away with all the money, you know, hoping to take the money and, and, and fight another day. And Mark Antony kind of followed her. Uh, once the, uh, the rest of Mark Antony and Cleopatra's navy saw that they were being abandoned by their leaders, they basically gave up en masse to Octavian. And the soldiers who were waiting on the land, because there were soldiers waiting on the land as well, once they saw their leaders abandon them, they gave up en masse to Octavian. So what, what started off as kind of a brief naval skirmish ended up being a decisive victory for Octavian, because basically the entire army that uh, Antony and Cleopatra had brought to Actium had then kind of went over to Octavian's side. Uh, Cleopatra and Mark Antony escaped back to Alexandria, and uh, uh, Octavian went and pursued them there. You know, it kind of was like history repeating himself, like, like Julius Caesar pursuing uh, uh, Pompey to Egypt. So Octavian here is pursuing uh, Antony and Cleopatra back to Egypt. Antony, kind of seeing the writing on the wall, goes out to try to make one last stand against Octavian and die in, in, in kind of a suicidal last stand battle. Um, but before he's able to get there, Mark Antony's army abandons him and again goes en masse to Octavian's side. So Mark Antony, remember in this kind of suicidal frame of mind, um, heads back to the palace in a rage 
thinking that maybe even Cleopatra engineered uh, the abandoning of his army to to uh, Octavian. Maybe Cleopatra is trying to look ahead and try to get on Octavian's good side. So in this suicidal frame of mind and angry, he comes back to the palace and clearly uh, Cleopatra doesn't really want to want to see him at this point. So she sends a message to him that she has already committed suicide. And so Mark Antony, who really was in love with Cleopatra, I mean, spent years with her and they had children together and things, um, that was the final straw. And Mark Antony ends up, you know, basically falling on his sword in the palace in, in Alexandria. Uh, the message that was sent to him, though, that Cleopatra was dead, uh, was not actually true. Uh, Cleopatra had not killed herself. She probably just didn't want to see him in such a rage. And so um, when she heard that she had, he had stabbed herself, she ran over to him. And, and the story goes that he was still kind of alive. Uh, uh, he was bleeding out. He was going to die. But then he saw her alive. And I don't know what he must have thought. You know, you tricked me or, or what? Or am I dead? Are you a ghost? I don't know what he was thinking. But, uh, um, but she kind of uh, appeared to him first. Uh, and then watched him die uh, in the palace. Uh, Cleopatra then actually met with Octavian when Octavian came into Alexandria. Octavian kind of surrounded the palace and put Cleopatra under a house arrest, and uh, uh, Cleopatra and Octavian met. So Cleopatra had already gotten two Roman generals to keep her in charge of Egypt. You know, Julius Caesar had supported her to keep her in charge of Egypt. Mark Antony had joined forces with her, and, and she remained in charge of Egypt. And, uh, um, and so she was kind of going for a hat trick and, and seeing if she could get Octavian to, uh, to keep her in charge of Egypt. Um, Octavian, though, had no intention of keeping her in charge of Egypt. Remember, the whole war here was declaring war against Cleopatra. Uh, what M M Octavian wanted to do was he wanted to drag Cleopatra back to Rome and march her through the streets of Rome in a, in a triumph uh, and possibly even kill her then or at least put her under some kind of house arrest for the rest of her life. Uh, so, uh, um, so once, realized, once Cleopatra realized what... Um, Octavian had intended for her. Uh, she basically um, uh, smuggled a, a, the story goes that she smuggled a snake into the palace. Uh, in some uh, versions it's an asp, in other versions it's a cobra. And she used the poisonous snake to kill herself. And so we have then the double suicide of Mark Antony, followed by the suicide of Cleopatra. Now, because of Octavian's propaganda against Mark Antony about how Cleopatra was the seductress who had seduced Mark Antony and had, had made him into this non-Roman, had made him abandon his Roman ways, because of all that propaganda, Cleopatra comes down to us in history in this very negative light. Uh, one thing about women in the ancient world is the more powerful they actually were, the more negative things we often hear about them uh, in, in the history books. And Cleopatra certainly was one of the most powerful women at the time. And she controlled one of the most richest and powerful countries of Egypt. Uh, she was the last pharaoh of Egypt. She was officially the last pharaoh of Egypt. And, um, you know, uh, uh, even though, uh, you know, she's been depicted in movies by like Elizabeth Taylor and always seen as this kind of beautiful woman who seduced these uh, powerful Roman generals. Uh, by ancient accounts, uh, she wasn't that attractive. Rather, it was simply the force of her personality, uh, her ambition, and uh, uh, her charisma that um, basically uh, uh, kept her in power and uh, 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 kept her in control of the situation, even with Rome uh, kind of growing and expanding its power. Egypt was the last of the kind of Alexandrian, the Hellenistic uh, states that was still standing, uh, uh, was one of the last, I guess. And, uh, um, uh, and it had gone on for a long time. And uh, it seemed that uh, Ptolemy XII and Ptolemy XIII were kind of bending to Roman power, but Cleopatra uh, basically stayed uh, in control of Egypt for as long as she lived. Um, she was extremely intelligent uh, and she was extremely daring. You saw how she 
kind of wrapped herself up and, 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 and kind of smuggled herself into the palace when Julius Caesar was there. Um, you know, out of all the Ptolemaic rulers, so the, the Ptolemies, again, were generals of Alexander the Great, so they were Greek by nationality, they weren't Egyptian. And uh, uh, none of the Ptolemies even bothered to learn the Egyptian language. You know, all of the, uh, the Cleopatras and the Ptolemies that came before Cleopatra the Seventh, not one of them even bothered to learn the language of the people they were ruling over. Um, but Cleopatra did. Cleopatra supposedly knew something like, you know, 14 languages. Uh, she was extremely intelligent, extremely charismatic, and extremely uh, uh, kind of forceful of her personality and ambitious. And that's what kept her in power for so long, and that's what makes her uh, the, the last pharaoh of Egypt. Uh, so with Cleopatra's death, um, that's the end of the pharaohs of Egypt. Uh, uh, basically, Octavian understands how wealthy uh, a province Egypt is, and he basically takes it as his own personal property uh, once Rome gains control of it. He doesn't take it as like a province of Rome. It, uh, forever afterwards, Egypt will be a, one of the most important territories ruled by Rome and will be uh, basically ruled over directly by the emperor. They will never let anybody else come close to Egypt because Egypt has so much wealth and, uh, you know, obviously the Nile River uh, provides uh, fertile soil which provides surplus grain every single year. So the wealth of Egypt um, will be basically financing and, and be the breadbasket of the Mediterranean world through, uh, uh, through much of the Roman Empire and will be heavily guarded over uh, by the emperor themselves. So one of the reasons why Octavian is able to maintain his power as emperor is because he becomes so wealthy with Egypt in his back pocket and he no longer has to worry about grain riots uh, back in Italy. Uh, while Octavian is in Egypt, he, um, he spares most of Cleopatra's children. Uh, he actually sends uh, the children that Cleopatra had with Mark Antony over to his sister Octavia. So, hey, Octavia, here are these children that your husband had with another woman. You've got to raise them now. So uh, that's what he did with most of uh, Cleopatra's children, with the exception of Caesarian. So Caesarian, Cleopatra claimed, was the son of Julius Caesar. Uh, Octavian has Caesarian killed. He famously says, two Caesars is one Caesar too many. And uh, um, a Caesarian is, is executed on Octavian's orders, even though he's just basically a teenager at the time. And, uh, um, and Octavian, like I said, takes direct control of Egypt. Uh, at that point, uh, Octavian also uh, views the remains of Alexander the Great. Uh, and it may be the one point in history where somebody stood in front of Alexander the Great's tomb and says, you know, hey, I'm actually better than this guy. Because uh, Octavian, at this point, was, was still young, like Alexander the Great was when he died, and ruled over a vast empire, uh, as Alexander the Great did. But Octavian's empire was much more stable uh, than Alexander the Great's empire was. You know, as soon as Alexander the Great died, uh, Alexander the Great's empire completely fell apart. Uh, Octavian, on the other hand, will live a very long life, and the Roman Empire uh, uh, will last for another 500 years. So, uh, uh, so it's the one point in history where Octavian is standing in front of uh, uh, Alexander the Great's tomb, and he can actually say, I am, uh, I'm better than this guy. All right. So um, the Roman Revolution. Uh, when we get to uh, Octavian here, Octavian supposedly says he restores the Republic. Uh, he reinitiates, you know, elections to consul, to praetor. Uh, uh, he, he does all these things with the Senate. We're going to uh, take a closer look at exactly what Octavian does uh, next year when we look at the first emperor and, and the, the later emperors of Rome. Um, but in effect, what, what, even though Octavian is kind of putting up this charade, that, he, uh, that he's restored the Republic, he's the one who maintains complete control of everything. You could see it through his direct control of Egypt, you know, Egypt being the most wealthy province. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, Octavian's direct control of Egypt helps him maintain complete power. 
Um, he calls himself princeps, or or sometimes what's known as like first citizen, uh, uh, or kind of like this idea that he's one amongst equals. So and and, and this idea goes back to. Uh, older Roman tradition. So it's not like uh, Octavian's trying to make it look like he, he's not creating anything new here. There was always like uh, uh, the lead man in Rome, you know, the person who w had the most authority amongst the senators, the person who was uh, 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 the, the primal person uh, in Roman politics. There was always kind of this lead man in Rome and or, or first man in Rome. And uh, that is kind of the title that Octavian gives himself, kind of going back to these older traditions. But really what he's made himself is the first emperor of Rome. And even though he keeps this charade up of the Republic uh, going, he behind the scenes is the one who's still in control of the military. He's the one who's still in control of all the money. Uh, he's the one who's in control directly of Egypt. And he does a lot of other things by, uh, you know, reorganizing the Senate in different ways and uh, reorganizing the provinces in different ways that uh, maintains his own personal power of, of everything, pretty much. And then he basically goes about creating a dynasty uh, uh, from that, uh, which, which we will eventually call the Julio-Claudian dynasty. Uh, so Octavian, therefore, makes himself the first emperor of Rome, and we see this complete political change from a republic where the Senate had this uh, morally binding authority and where uh, the patricians kind of dominated the, the magistracies for office uh, to an empire uh, where one person is in charge. Um, as I said before, uh, Octavian used Mycenaeus to hire poets and different things to spread his message. Um, he made building projects, which was kind of a physical representation of, uh, of his message to the people that he was in charge. Um, and, uh, you know, famously he said, you know, I found Rome a city of brick and left it a city of marble. So he rebuilds the city with his own finances. And again, that's symbolic of him kind of being in control of everything. He's given these titles. Princeps, like I said, is the title that he uses to kind of describe his position and the emperorship from him uh, all the way to maybe the Severan dynasty uh, is, is sometimes referred to as the Principate, uh, uh, you know, emperors who work under uh, uh, Augustus's model or Octavian's model of, of being this first amongst equals and, and of going back to these old traditions. Um, he's also given the title Augustus, and this is usually how we refer to him as the first emperor, Emperor Augustus. Uh, Augustus is more of a religious title, though. It really means like the revered one. It, it's related to that word augur, the, the priests that foretell the future by, you know, looking at signs from the gods in the sky. Um, why did, the, uh, did this Roman revolution happen? Why uh, uh, did everything fall apart, did the late Republic fall apart? Uh, we've talked about before how the Republic, you know, was designed uh, basically to govern a city-state and now had to, had to govern this huge empire. And there was this vast difference between rich and poor. Uh, it's interesting that the middle and poorer classes uh, distrusted the Senate. They hated the Senate. They thought that they were all corrupt, that, uh, like people say today, that was just a swamp. And they were looking for one strong man, a person to represent their interest against all these aristocrats. Uh, and so that's what they saw in Augustus. They saw the, the, the one person that's going to represent the, the interests of the, the working class and the, the, the middle class uh, as opposed to these, uh, these rich senators. Uh, and, and so it's interesting that uh, the common people, you know, um, uh, you know rather than uh, thinking that they were giving up their freedoms, were actually looking for Augustus to take more power uh, in order to represent their interest against what they saw was a, an aristocratic class that, that had uh, uh, never had uh, the working class people's interest in mind. Um, other things, you, you saw this just constant violence, you know, starting with the Gracchi brothers, of them introducing real physical violence into the political system and, and how it took these drastic changes in order to finally, uh, uh, you know, exercise that violence away from the political system. Once you have physical violence in the political system, it's hard to get rid of it. 
we saw the gang fighting in the streets, you know, Clodius's uh, fighting versus uh, Milo's fighting. Uh, we saw different groups of people, kind of uh, different factions, you know. Uh, uh, there was a famous writer named Ronald Syme who wrote a book called The Roman Revolution who blamed uh, the fall of the Republic. Uh, uh, he, he blamed it on, on the emergence of these factions, these almost kind of like political parties, the optimates and populares, the boni, the conservatives versus the liberals and the, not the liberals, the the uh, the the populists, uh, 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 so these these factions that that rose up, and that 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 it became so, um, uh, so much against each other that that they tore apart the republic in a way, and one of the biggest things that that led to this this revolution was simply the constant civil wars. I mean, we're talking about generation after generation after generation of civil wars. One side purging another side, and then another side coming to power and purging the other side, where, where nobody was safe, where everybody felt that at any moment they could die. I mean, first you had the Gracchi brothers versus the Senate. Then you had, you know, uh, uh, Marius versus Sulla. And then you had... Uh, Pompey versus Caesar, and then you had Octavian versus Mark Antony. You know, it's just generation after generation of civil war. And the Romans were just tired and sick of the constant civil war, of the constant bloodshed, of fearing their neighbors, uh, uh, of all of these things that, that you could see how, how by the time we get to Octavian, um, the, uh, you know, people were about ready to give up a, a lot of their rights just for some peace and some security. And, and that's what uh, Octavian promised to the Roman people. He promised uh, the Pax Romana, the Roman peace, an end to all of the civil wars and bloodshed. Um, you saw changing morals, you know, uh, the Caesar, the actions of Caesar, Antony, Cleopatra. Um, and you saw all of these things kind of combine to form this this pivotal stage in in history um and octavian ended up basically just being the last person standing uh and again part of the reasons for his success kind of lay behind the people that he worked together with um and the fact that he always kind of played that long game you know, he was always looking, you know, first working with Cicero, even going against Mark Antony at first, you know, always looking ahead, you know, trying to play two steps ahead. Uh, so that those are some of the keys to Octavian or Augustus' success. We'll look at that more closely next year in Latin 3. Um, but I hope that uh, you enjoyed this, uh, this kind of... Uh, kind of general overview of the Roman Revolution, but getting into many of the key players and hopefully it piques your interest to look more deeply into uh, any one of these aspects uh, of the Roman Revolution. Uh, thank you.